Um, Sergeant Pfeiffer, um, when we left off, when we left off with your testimony yesterday, um, we had finished watching the video out there by Kunal Implement um, to give us a perspective of what vegetation would look like in July of twenty. Well, in July um, of, of um, uh, any given summer, correct? Correct. Um, were there also still images that were collected that would give a perspective of what that area looked like there at the pond if you were to um, look down into that drive that would be that steep grade? Yes, there was. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's previously been marked as states as 97 through 97 May I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. And then I'm I'm handing you what's marked as State's Exhibit 97-1 through 97-6 for purposes of identification. Do you recognize that group, group exhibit? Yes, I do. How do you recognize that group exhibit? It is the area where the skeletal remains of Breja Charles' body were recovered. Okay. When were these photographs taken? These were taken in July of this year, 2023. Um, do these photographs simply um, provide a representation of what that area would have looked like um, when there was foliage on the trees um, and everything was in full bloom? I believe it's similar. Okay. Your Honor, at this time the state would move to introduce state's exhibits 97-1 through 97-6. Those exhibits will be admitted. Your Honor, may I publish those? You may. Okay. Sergeant Pfeiffer, please describe what's depicted in State's Exhibit 97.1. This exhibit is a photograph from the gravel road. Make sure I get my numbers right, 270th Avenue. This is the access driveway that drops down into the area around the pond um, from July of this year. As we look at the photograph, where would the pond be located? You can see just a little bit of the shadowing, but the pond is just here, um, pretty much in the center of the screen. Okay. There is a large tree um, that um, is in the vicinity of where you have pointed to. Is that the tree that we saw um, in a previous diagram that would have essentially that circle drive that would go around the tree? Yes, if you call your attention to this sort of uh, fork in the road as you come down this um, driveway, there's slight pass off to the left and then to the right, and they, they do make a full circle around this area. Okay. Um, I've used the term driveway. Is that really a very apt description? It's an entrance way of some kind. It is gravel, and it's unfinished, and uh, fairly, this is a fairly steep terrain. Please describe what we are seeing in State's Exhibit 97.2. So this is a view looking more towards the, it would be the north east. So this is essentially near the, the pond down here at the bottom of the screen. And this is the, um, that loop driveway as you're going back out towards the, the entrance point. When we look to the background where we see the trees and the foliage, is that where Briege's remains were found? Yes, she was recovered in this general area uh, up here where the pointer is in the screen. Okay. And you had indicated, you know, toward the north um, east side, if you were to continue north, would you be walking toward Kunal Implement? Essentially, this, it's all in a curvature setting there, the way the property is laid out. States Exhibit 97.3. 97.3 is an overview from a, a drone image that, again, we um, 
captured on July of this year, 2023. And this is the same area as the last slide. Um, you can see that, that entranceway and the area where her remains were found are right in this general area. Okay. Is this more of an aerial perspective in this image? Yes, it is. All right. States Exhibit 97.4. Ninety-seven point four is a photograph um, showing the the area of foliage in the same general area that we've been speaking of, and just in this area here where these uh, weed trees are, and this other foliage is the location where Briage's body was found. Ninety-seven point five. Again, it's a similar uh, view of what we had just looked at in 97.4, just showing from the grassy area of that circle drive, um, looking into that northeastern type direction uh, where her body was found in this, under all of this uh, vegetation. And then finally, 97.6. So this would be a view facing mostly west you, you would still have uh, the pond area out here in the middle of the screen, but off to the right-hand side of your screen here on this image, her body was over in this general area. Right. Sergeant Pfeiffer, just given the um, amount of vegetation in that area, if a body were disposed um, in the locations that you've identified um, during the month of July, would it be very difficult for anyone to discover that body? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Sergeant Pfeiffer, when um, law enforcement um, was called out to um, handle initially what was thought to be a missing child report, um, as the day developed, um, uh, what steps were being taken? Um, when Briasia wasn't being located? Steps that were initially taken involved some early cellular telephone records uh, requests for the people that we knew involved within the circle of people of Briasia. Those records take some time to obtain, so those, those were done um, in fairly soon fashion. We organized with outside agencies in our, in our neighboring jurisdictions uh, for other resources, both human resources and technology tools that included the use of drones. Uh, there were state aircraft involved and throughout the, the days uh, the Med Force helicopter was utilized in certain areas. What do you mean by a Med Force helicopter? Our local uh, medevac um, helicopter service offered their services um, with their helicopter to fly some of the areas. Were press releases being issued by the Davenport Police Department um, uh, to um, notify the public of Briasia's missing in the event that they could provide any potential leads? Yes, there were multiple press releases made. Some of them included methods to self-organized search parties in groups of 30 or less, and then there were other organized search efforts in different locations depending on the day and the data that was driven the locations. So we use um, media and our, our uh, public outreach uh, tools to try to help uh, organize those searches so that they were purposeful and and had an organization to them. Sure. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel as remarked as State's Exhibit 105. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. I'm handing you what's remarked as State's Exhibit 105. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 105? Yes, I do. What is State's Exhibit 105? Exhibit 105 
contains photographs that were issued in a press release uh, sent out by the Davenport Police Department providing our website that was dedicated to um, a missing child case, which for this it was created for Briasia Terrell. In this picture, there were images that um, we wanted the public to notify us of in the event that they saw any of these things while this investigation um, was was beginning. Did it have a photograph of Briasia? Yes. Um, did it have any photographs of a subject of interest? Yes. Who was the subject of interest? Henry Dinkins. And did it have photographs of vehicles that were associated with Henry Dinkins? Yes, it does. How many? Three. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to introduce State's Exhibit 105. Exhibit 105 will be admitted. Okay. Your Honor, may we publish this? You may. Sergeant Pfeiffer, as we look at State's Exhibit 105, has information been redacted from this particular press release? Yes, there is. Okay. All right. So this area on State's Exhibit 105, um, was there some type of um, information put out to the public um, uh, to facilitate assistance? Yes. All right. Um, that notwithstanding, how is this captioned at the top? Just as it reads, a person of interest identified in a missing child case, Davenport Police asks anyone with information to call 911. Okay. And then is the um, web address set up on this press release? Yes, it is. All right. And then just beyond that, then, do we have Briage's photograph? Yes. How many photographs of Mr. Dinkins? Three. And then is there photographs for each vehicle associated with him? Yes, there is. Could you describe those vehicles for our written record? On the lower left corner of this image, there is a picture of the white motor home, which was described as the, the residence for Henry Dinkins. In the middle, there is a maroon Chevy Impala, which was relayed to us as a vehicle operated by Henry Dinkins. And then to the far lower right, there is a black Chevy Camaro, which is uh, identified as a vehicle also operated by Henry Dinkins. Okay. Where was the RV located or stored at? It was stored in the... Um, the 700 block of South Schmidt Road in Davenport. What relationship does that location have to the um, entry of Credit Island? It's within probably 400 meters of, of Credit Island. All right. Um, with respect to Andrea Culberson and Mr. Dinkins' apartment up at 7, um, let me see, 7, I'm getting that wrong, 7433. Jersey Meadows apartment, apartment number eight, and I may have that address wrong. Um, the maroon Chevy Impala and the black Camaro, were those kept up there for their use? They were kept at the 2744 East 53rd address at Jersey Meadows, yes. Thank you for correcting me on that. And then as, as we look at these photographs of the vehicles, um, where are they located so we've got a perspective? At the time? That these photographs were being taken. At the time of these photographs were taken, they are in a evidence processing area. Had they been seized? Yes. Had there been a number of search warrants obtained for each of those vehicles? Yes, there was. Were those search warrants executed? Yes. All right, and then was there evidence that was seized from each of those vehicles? Yes, there was. Sergeant Spike Pfeiffer, speak to the weather conditions of July 9th in the evening and going into the early morning hours of July 10th of 2020. The weather conditions were rainy and at, at times stormy. Okay. Did that later become significant to the investigation? Yes, it did. Um, and just, just to give us a brief perspective, why? There, during the search of uh, the maroon Chevy Impala, 
there was um, mud that was caked, stuck to the undercarriage of the vehicle, and that mud was still there several days um, after the vehicle had been seized. And we know that the vehicle drove um, quite a bit during the, the daytime hours without rain on July 10th. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to um, uh, some earlier testimony that you had provided. Um, you were describing basically um, what was being done in attempts to locate Briasia. Now, were there major canvases done um, over a period of time? Yes, there was. On July 10th, we've discussed the canvas <clears throat> out in the area of the Jersey Meadow apartment complex. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I want you to speak to the issue of how far that extended beyond the area of the apartment complex and even that field beat behind the apartment complex to the north. So that search, as you've mentioned, extended to different areas around uh, the 74 bridge. There's a, a area where there's a creek bed we covered areas of field north of those apartment areas and several areas where there would have been any sort of um, uh, tips that, that would have come in of any sightings uh, of something to look for. Okay. Um, did that extend out um, uh, to the west? On 53rd? Uh, towards the west, we, we went to Jersey Ridge area, um, Veterans Memorial Parkway area, and where Eastern Avenue and Veterans Memorial Parkway intersect, there is another area of open grass in um, land that is, I would call it, just un, unmowed. Uh, that separates Veterans Memorial Parkway with some field areas uh, to get to Interstate 80 to okay. the north. And then on the um, uh, south side of 53rd, um, beyond the businesses, um, is there residential um, neighborhoods to the south of that um, uh, um, uh, business district? Yes, there is. Okay. Um, were areas to the south as far as those um, neighborhoods and the residences canvassed? Uh, there was, and additionally, the area of 53rd Street from Eastern Avenue to um, Brady Street was under heavy construction. Those areas were all searched um, within that time frame uh, to the point there was even a, a torrential storm during one of those mm -hmm. uh, events, and we actually had to rescue several of our officers out of some pretty serious storms in that particular area. Okay. Did that include going to residences in those locations? Yes. What were officers doing when they would deploy into those neighborhoods? They were looking for video surveillance cameras affixed to houses and walking around with, with pictures and flyers and knocking on doors um, asking anyone had they seen anything. Did that develop any leads whatsoever? And don't, don't speak to the issue of video surveillance feed, but just making contact with people who lived in the area. We didn't find anybody that saw anything. Okay. Sergeant Piper, I, I want to go back to State's Exhibit 38. Let's go ahead and let's put that back up here. On the... Um, I know it's going to be difficult to see, but can you give us a perspective just based on that map around the Jersey Meadow Apartments, what areas would have been encompassed? So where I have the pointer and you see the yellow dots is the general area around the apartments. And in the lower right-hand screen, you see a more blown up version of some of that concentrated area around the apartment complex. Okay. Let's speak to the issue of video surveillance footage. Why were you looking for any locations that had video cameras um, affixed to the physical structures? Video cameras will oftentimes 
uh, capture you know any sort of movement um, and they don't require any human uh, interaction and to you know you know help develop this this theory that Briasia got up and walked away in the middle of the night um, but with a, a time of uncertainty in, in our perspective at that moment uh, it, it is important for us to see did do any of the cameras in these residences around there did they see this little girl walking around and which would um, presumably, in our opinion, be lost, okay. being in an area of unfamiliarity. Based on canvases and based on video footage that was collected, was there anything to support the theory that Briasia just got up in the middle of the night and walked away? No. All right. Um, was there video surveillance footage um, that was collected that would help um, establish the movements of Henry Dinkins during the middle of the night of July 10th and even into the morning hours of July 10th? Yes, there was. All right. Now, um, uh, let's talk mm -hmm. about other canvases that you conducted on July 10th. Um, what other areas did you do a canvas of? The area of Credit Island was of interest. Why? On July 10th. We were provided information that uh, Henry Dinkins was in the area of Credit Island with his son. All right. Um, so describe what you did in canvassing that area. We assembled groups of officers and members of the public also uh, assimilated in that area to do a walking search of Credit Island. And if you're unfamiliar with it, I can point it to the map here, but this area that is essentially in the middle of the Mississippi River down here in the lower left corner is truly an island with one uh, causeway, um, driveway, bridge type of thing to access it. And the only other access point to it without a boat is a pedestrian bridge on the further south side of it that connects to the, the other southwest side of the city of Davenport. So those are the two ways to access Credit Island from Davenport uh, with, without boat. For purposes of our written record, and I, I think we all recognize um, where Credit Island is located, but what would be the main thoroughfare that runs along the Mississippi River on our southernmost border? As far as a roadway, yeah. it would be South Concord Street follows the riverbed for the most part. And in the area where you enter Credit Island, it is actually River Drive. All right. <clears throat> Yesterday, civilian crime scene technician Jill Foster had testified um, as having been sent down to that area for purposes of photographing footprints. Um, were you out there at the scene when that development was taking place? I was not there for collecting footprints. Were you aware of those footprints out there on Credit Island? Yes. Okay. All right. Was there anything beneficial that came of that canvas? No. Was Briasia found there? No. Okay. Um, was there an item, a clothing item or a shoe item that was found out there um, that um, a, you know, created questions about whether or not it could have potentially been Briasia's? Yes. What was that item? There was a flip-flop shoe. Okay. Um, and would that have been um, a topic of discussion in follow-up with Briasia's mother, Aisha Langford? Yes. All right. All right. Now, um, beyond that, how um, committed was the community um, in their efforts to try and locate Briasia? It was the largest form of unsolicited um, support uh, that I had seen in a couple of decades of, of public service work ever. All right. At any point in time down in the area of Credit Island, was there um, members of the public who were out and requested assistance because they thought they might have found something? Yes, there was. Describe that. <clears throat> We encountered multiple phone calls to our 911 center that uh, people had found um, different items of clothing they thought might have been relevant. Uh, we had a couple uh, calls. One of them in particular was somebody called 911 and they were uh, frantic and they were on the phone saying that you, you just walked past us. You just walked past her. She's right there. She's in a tree. Um, what you know? What are you doing? I, I, this is just the, the frantic ramblings that I remember from those phone calls, and they they made no sense. Um, our search parties were there when these calls were coming in, uh, so there's there, there was a lot of 
um, calls brought in to us, um, people saying they were they were mediums and psychics and uh, just a variety of things that were um, we were unable to make contact with some sort of rational thought or solution. Okay, and any time a tip came in, um, did it develop anything of value related to um, Briasia Terrell and her being missing? No. Okay, speak to the issue of a well. Um, that members of the public um, had come across and had reached out to law enforcement about? Throughout the course of this searching of Credit Island, I received a call that there were people using a, uh, a fish finder device of some sort, and they had come across an abandoned well. I don't know what the well was or what it was for, but it was full of water, and this fisherman... Um, had thought that he had seen something that resembled a face by utilizing his sonar equipment. Um, so plans were devised at that time um, with our partners from the Davenport Fire Department to uh, bring some equipment down there to uh, pump the water out of that well and try to determine if, if that was Briasia. What were the findings? There was nothing found in there. So when you stop and consider all of those search efforts, um, did um, anything that law enforcement did or the public did in attempts to locate Briasia suggest that this was a sim simply a situation of a child who wandered off? No. All right. Let's talk about um, cellular devices. Um, explain the import of cellular devices and how that becomes an important investigative tool to law enforcement. I'm not able to speak to the actual technicalities of it all, um, but in a general sense, we use cellular technology in a, in a variety of uh, investigative efforts, uh, but in, in a general sense, cellular telephones communicate with cellular towers, and the signals that communicate from the, the towers to those devices, there is... There is a frame of time that it takes from a signal to get from one device to the next, and those times are measured. And through that process, um, return trip time is one of the phrases that you, you'll hear used in it, and other people can explain the, the more technicalities of it. But essentially, you're able to determine uh, distance, how far away from a particular cell phone tower uh, that device may have been at that point in time. And then you have other... Um, pieces of technology within cellular devices that are maybe more commonly understood as, as GPS, or global positioning systems. And some devices are able to provide us with, you know, very precise uh, location information. And in this particular time of, of our world, almost everybody has a cellular device on them of some sort, whether it's a device that's attached to your vehicle for your mapping systems or just simply your, your tablet or your phone. And it is uh, very common for um, a large majority of our population to have some sort of communication device with them that is operating on the cellular network or somehow communicating with, with the actual Internet um, through other means, which could be uh, Wi-Fi technology as well. Was that an investigative tool that was used in this investigation? Yes. Okay. And did that relate specifically to the cell phone of Henry Dinkins? Yes, it did. All right. And then I just want you to speak very briefly to a particular topic because that will be developed through other testimony. Um, when um, uh, there was an interest in Henry Dinkins' cell phone, um, were there search warrants obtained for that cell phone? Yes. Okay. Um, and was there... Um, a very important break in the case that came early on that law, law enforcement utilized? Yes, there was. Explain. The first identification of a cellular signal of interest in this process was a brief contact with the cell phone that we had for Henry Dinkins when it made contact with the cellular antenna tower in Comanche, Iowa. Go ahead and let's go back to States Exhibit 38. Um, what is the relationship of Comanche, Iowa to the, um, um, uh, I, I guess, main um, um, uh, 
highway street end to Clinton. And let me do a little bit better job. If you're going down Highway 61 um, and you want to go um, into Clinton, what direction are you going to travel? So just to recap so I don't confuse, you would go north on 61 and then at Highway 30 you would come back to the east. Okay. And Comanche is situated right here where the pointer is in this upper right hand corner of the of this map. All right. Um, Highway 30, as you enter the city limits of Clinton, what's the name of that street? I can't think of it off the top of my head other than 30. Lincoln Way? I, without looking, I, I don't recall. Okay. I'm sorry. It, does Lincoln Way sound familiar? It is one of the streets there. Okay, gotcha. All right, and then um, relative to that ping, um, uh, what area would it have focused on an area there in Clinton? Yes, it did. Okay. All right. Um, so then with that piece of information, how was that utilized from an investigative standpoint? At that point in time, having the signal in that area for just a, a, a brief minute, the amount of usage out of that connectivity um, was analyzed by a few of us and it from me and having done a lot of work with cellular uh, phone devices in different cases there was literally little to no data exchanged within that contact point um, which seemed different for me for someone to turn on a phone but not use it um, so that seemed different from things I had seen in the past. And at that point, we, we started to involve some other uh, partners that, that had more knowledge uh, with that specific area of cellular technology. Um, what other partners did you involve? At that point, the FBI was involved. Uh, there's a member from uh, the CAST unit, which is their cellular analytics. Um, there's a couple other acronyms in there that I don't know. Survey team? Uh, yeah. There we go. That sounds good. Okay. Um, and they'll be able to speak to their to their portions of that. With the enlistment of their assistance, those that particular signal contact in that Comanche Tower, they were able to make pretty quick sense of that and and, and use their skill sets for the things that they, they know. Okay. By virtue of that, then, did that um, uh, um, uh, lead to another major canvas that was done outside of Scott County? Yes, it did. Okay. Going back to States Exhibit 38, um, explain that um, and the areas that that canvas focused on. So initially, we knew that based off of the antenna element that was provided to us, the Comanche Tower, if you see these blue sort of uh, angle lines from this blue dot in Comanche, that represents the cellular tower. And this particular tower has three sides to it and signals um, branch off of it in one of three directions. And the direction that this momentary um, contact was made with that tower is in that area you see projecting to the north. So initial uh, video canvas and uh, foot canvas work was initiated in that area to see if anything of familiarity with what we had known so far to be related to um, Henry Dinkins, Briasia Terrell, and the involved vehicles uh, were able to be observed in that area. Sergeant Piper, um, Sergeant Ellerbach will be um, uh, testifying later on, but on this map, did you um, uh, um, indicate how broad the canvassing took place in Clinton County in some fashion so that the court has some perspective of the areas that were covered? Absolutely. If you see this area that is outlined in pink, and then there are um, shaded pink markings within this, the pink boxes, they all, if, you, if you're close enough, you can see they have an area and a numerical um, identifier to those areas. And Sergeant Ellerbach will, will explain how those areas were and how they managed those particular search groups with uh, different operational structure. Uh, but that entire area was was canvassed around that area and again you can see a large portion of that 
speaks to the, the array coming from that cellular antenna direction. By virtue of that canvas, um, did it develop any evidence that would lead to the discovery of Umbriasia Terrell? And I should actually call it searches, by virtue of searching that area. Nothing other than video. Okay, all right. And then we're going to speak to video here in a moment. But then the um, next question, I need to be more definitive when I talk about searches versus canvassing. Um, is most of that area um, rural? Yes, with the exception of that immediate area where there's some commercial businesses. And in this instance, um, were there any areas where officers would have gone out um, in neighborhoods and knocked on doors to see if anybody had any information that they could provide? Yes. All right. And did that produce any information at all? No. All right. Now, let's go to um, uh, the topic that you've brought up. We've got a perspective of how um, cellular devices became very important to this investigation. But now tell us how location or GPS information from cellular devices then um, would then lead to another very important investigative tool um, that was utilized by the Davenport Police Department. In this particular area? Yeah, in, and in each of our <coughs> areas that we searched. Because of the Comanche area, there, there was video surveillance um, obtained in that area, and there were cameras along uh, Highway 30 that had captured um, the maroon vehicle, which was um, on the list of vehicles associated with Henry Dinkins, and that was present on a couple of different camera surveillance systems, and most notably at the Walmart and Clinton uh, we were able to observe uh, Henry Dinkins' uh, maroon Chevy Impala in the parking lot of Walmart. And then further, um, we observed Henry Dinkins walk from his Chevy Impala into the Walmart. And then what did he do there? Uh, within the, the store, uh, he purchased two bottles of Clorox bleach. Okay. Um, what time of the morning would that have occurred and what date? It was just after 7 a.m., um, on the morning of July 10th. And is that before he's made the telephone call to Aisha at um, 8.08 a.m. to report to her that Briasia is missing? Yes, it's before that. Okay. Um, is Clorox something that would be significant to you as a law enforcement officer? Yes, it is. Why? Uh, Clorox bleach is used as a disinfectant and a cleanser. It is used both to conceal evidence in crime scenes, and it's also used to clean our own tools um, and prepare things so that they're sanitary okay. uh, for the purposes that they, um, it is used to kill blood-borne pathogens for safety purposes for our, our own equipment and our cabinets. Okay. Were there video surveillance feed or was there video surveillance feed that was also collected down in the area of the Jersey Meadow apartments along 53rd on Eastern um, and Jersey Ridge? Yes. And then down in the area of Credit Island in particular where that RV was stored, was there vi video surveillance footage that was collected that ended up being very beneficial to the investigation? Yes, there was. Um, does that give us just um, a very good perspective um, of what um, the investigation consisted of and how it was handled. Yes, it does. I have no further questions of this witness at this time, Your Honor, and I would reserve the rights to recall this witness later on. Mr. Fries. Yes. Henry, any place other than that area, the pink area, 
At around 3.30 that morning. The quick shop at 53rd and Sheridan in Davenport. As far as we can tell. She did not come in the store if she was. In all these uh, beneficial videos that you have, how many videos, first of all, were uh, seized in this investigation? Hundreds. I don't know the exact count. When you say hundreds, hundreds of videos from uh, businesses and uh, locations along what you thought might be Henry, Drink Henry Dinkins' uh, area of travel, right? And everywhere to establish a possible area. Out of those hundreds, were you able to winnow down uh, those videos into a smaller number that may have information on it that concerns Henry Dinkins or a purple Impala? Yes. And how many of those were there? I don't know off the top of my head. And when did you start um, looking for these videos for Mr. Dinkins' movements and this Impala? Immediately. Why did you immediately start looking for the movements of Mr. Dinkins and this Impala? Simply because Mr. Dinkins was the last person to be with Briasia Terrell. He took care and control of her the night before at his residence for an overnight visit with his son and he was the last person to have been with her. You say been with her. What do you mean been with her? He, he was the, the custodial caregiver for her at his residence that night. As, as was Andrea Culberson, right? Correct. And what uh, step did you do to backtrack the events of Andrea Culberson that night? We also went through her cellular phone and her movements and her interview of about where she was. And what did you do to backtrack the steps of Aisha Langford? Uh, similar. We uh, also went through her cell phone and places where uh, she was and where she was that morning. Did you get videos like this for Aisha Langford? Uh, she was not in any videos that we had. Did you try to get any videos like you did for... Uh, Miss Langford. Like Absolutely. Okay. Because um, you understand, you have no evidence, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have no evidence, no witness, no video, no pictures that puts Briasia Terrell in that Impala that night. Andrea Culberson provided information that when she looked out the window, Briasia was next to that Impala in the overnight hours of early morning hours of July 10th with Henry Dinkins when he had came back to the apartment. Again, my question is, you have no evidence that puts Briasia Terrell inside that Impala, right? She was no longer in the parking lot after the Impala left the parking lot. You have no witness, no trace evidence, no physical evidence that puts her in that Impala. That's correct. Okay. And when Andrea Culberson said she saw Briasia outside the Impala, she told you that Briasia was outside the Impala alone, right? Right. And Henry Dinkins was in the apartment or coming into the apartment, correct? Correct. And Andrea Culberson also told you that she did not question Mr. Dinkins as to why Briasia was outside, did she? Correct. How long did it become before Mr. Dinkins became uh, the person you were focusing on in this investigation? <clears throat> With respects to time, I don't know a, a time frame of, of what you're asking for some transitional points, but he had always remained the last person to be with her and his um, movements in the middle of the night while she was missing and lack of doing something that a normal adult would do when a 10-year-old child is in their care and custody um, I, I think piques the interest of, of anybody who has ever um, had a child or cared for a child 
would understand that when a 10 year old that you're responsible for is missing and there is no sense of alarm, there's not a phone call made, there were no doors knocked on in the adjacent apartments, there was none of those things done yet by the time the police arrived in the daytime hours. And when you have these types of facts of a young child in an unfamiliar area and the person solely responsible for her has indicated that he has done nothing to try to find her whereabouts other than drive around in a, in a large 40 some mile loop. Okay. So with that in mind, you, and you knew that right away. Within a day, you knew that's what he had done, right? Right. You knew that when he came to the police station voluntarily that, that day, right? When he came that morning, we did not know all of his travels, no. Okay. It didn't take long, though, did it? That's relative. I was there for several days in a row. Okay. Well, within several days, you knew all this information, and uh, the forces of your investigation honed in on Mr. Dinkins. That's a fair statement. That is fair. And... Uh, what investigation were you doing looking into possible other suspects? There were multiple, and when I say multiple, this is the largest multi-agency thing that I've been a part of in, in two decades of this business. Um, there were state DCI police involved, and there were FBI agents uh, that had come in from several different home offices to assist with this. And they investigated leads around people that Henry Dinkins was associated with um, and, and a variety of other activities. And those avenues were explored. There were even search warrants conducted at um, other associates of Henry Dinkins where cellular analysis took place. Um, and other agencies would call you with information they thought might be relevant to the disappearance of Brazier Terrell, right? At times, yeah. One of those agencies was the Rock Island Police Department, correct? We had multiple. I don't know what thing you're specifically getting at. Do you know the name Tina No or Noe? I, I do, yeah. She contacted you, right? Yes, she did. Why did she contact you? She contacted me regarding a, um, an investigation that she had on um, CS. Okay. And CS was a child living with uh, Briasia Terrell, correct? Correct. <laughs> And she had information about CS that she thought might be relevant to the disappearance of Brigitte Terrell, right? I don't find it to be relative, no. Why not? Do you have specific statements you're speaking to? You put them in a report, right? If you have one authored by me, you have it. But I handled literally hundreds of phone calls in that time.
proceed, Mr. Freeze. Detective, you did talk to Officer Tina No from the Rock Island Police Department. Yes, I did. And Officer No advised you that she had information regarding Rage's brother, CS, correct? Yes. And she told you that, in her opinion, that information regarding CS may have some relevance to the uh, investigation into the disappearance of Breeja Terrell, right? I, I don't recall the exact contents of it. I, I know the nature of the case that she was working with him. And um, we could agree that the information that was provided by Tina No was not followed up on by the Davenport Police Department. I don't know the exact things that you're speaking of, so I, I can't answer what you're insinuating, I know. Okay. Very well. Um, now, outline for me again your, your role in this investigation. You're supervising the detectives? Yes. So when detectives receive information and reduce it to a report, you, rep you approve the reports, right? Correct. Um, do you read all the reports? Yes, I do. Um, is AJ, I'm, I'm going to butcher this name, I'm sorry. Poirier. Poirier, one of your detectives? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know who Special Agent Rick Ron is? Yes, I do. Tell the court who Special Agent Rick Ron is. Rick Ron is now retired, uh, but he is the, uh, at the time, was the area commander for the major, came, major crime uh, side of the uh, DCI for the state, and he was the overall uh, commander for the state side. Okay, so very respected law enforcement officer. Yes. Very decorated, correct? Yes. Um, in the 10 days following uh, the disappearance of Briasia, there was a homicide investigation that occurred in Clinton. Were you aware of that? Yes. And uh, there was evidence seized in that case uh, from a gentleman that a search warrant was executed upon his vehicle. Were you aware of that? Yes. Recall that person's name? No, I do not. Was his name Kyle Julian? Ring a bell? I honestly don't remember the name that, that was provided in that one. Okay. Do you recall that uh, Special Agent Ron was involved in the search of a Dodge Challenger belonging to Kyle Julian? Yes. And tell the court what was found in the trunk of that Dodge Challenger belonging to Mr. Julian. That's my recollection. I believe it was a white shirt. Okay. What kind of shirt was it? I believe it was a white T-shirt, but without seeing the document, I don't okay. know for certain. Was there any other shirt found? I don't know off of memory. Okay. What were the significance of these shirts? It was relayed to me from Special Agent Rick Ron that there was uh, potentially uh, blood on it. And these shirts were around youth size 10, right? If that's what it reflects, I, I don't remember the size of it. Okay. Um, size 10 or 12 would be about the size of Briasia Terrell, correct? I believe so. And Clinton, we know now, is, is an area of interest, correct? Correct. Do you know what Rick Ron, Special Agent Rick Ron, did with those shirts? He turned them over to Detective Poirier. Okay. Where are those shirts today? I believe they're in evidence, or they could be at the lab. I'm not sure their exact location. If there were blood stains found on children's shirts 10 days after the disappearance of Briasia Terrell, that would be relevant to the investigation, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, what's the connection between those two cases? Briasia Terrell is missing, agreed? Agreed. You have Henry Dinkins for some reason in Clinton, agreed? Agreed. 10 days after... Uh, Brasia Terrell winds up missing. Somebody is found having children's clothes in the trunk of his car, covered in blood. And you don't want to. You don't think that's relevant? Not given the facts of that case and the people involved, and there were children involved in the household with that other homicide that has no causal connection to this okay. event. So you respect Rick Ron's. Opinions, right? I do. You respect Rick Ron's decisions, right? 
I do. You just don't respect it in this one when he gave it to you guys at the Davenport Police Department 10 days after Briasia Terrell's disappearance to, to give it to you as evidence and to test. He also had the ability to have it tested if he felt his office with an open case in this investigation, if he wanted it tested through his lab, but he did not provide causal connection to these two incidents. Okay, so it's Rick Ron's fault that these uh, shirts aren't tested? It would have been up to him if he wanted to test them. In the Briasia Terrell case? He could have, yes. Okay. Who's, running the, who's running the Briasia Terrell case? Is it Davenport, FBI, DCI? There's multiple entities in it. Okay. So he gave them to you and kind of just said it may not be worth anything? He collected it and said he collected it, and he explained the circumstances that he collected it under. Okay. The point is nobody tested the bloody shirts, right? At that time? At any time. Correct. Okay. To this day, we don't know whose blood is on that shirt, right? The, there was a later uh, lab submission done on that shirt. Okay. Hey, was it Beresia Terrell? No. Okay. Um, we don't have any blood of Beresia Terrell anywhere in this case, do we? No. We don't have any blood in that Impala, do we? None. And just so the court's understanding, <clears throat> that Impala was searched extensively. To right? the best of anyone's abilities. I mean, you know, the, the local sheriff didn't search the, the uh, Impala. The FBI did, right? Correct. And when the FBI searches an Impala like this, they bring a special team from across the country to do this, right? Yes, they did. And they dress up in hazmat suits, correct? Yes. They wore rubber boots, correct? Yes, they did. They wear special gloves, right? They had gloves on. They wear helmets. Yes, they did. Uh, they have specialized tools. They I mean they have vacuums that are super high powered, like dust busters, don't they? Yes. And they vacuum that entire vehicle, top to bottom, to find any trace evidence, right? Correct. Trace evidence includes blood, right? Yes. It includes hair, right? Yes. Uh, it can include uh, skin sometimes, right? It can. Um, it can include just about anything that the body sloughs off, right? That's the whole point of this machine. Right. And they did that for hours on Henry Dinkins' Impala, right? Yes. And that was all analyzed, to your knowledge? Yes, by the FBI. And not one piece of trace evidence belonging to Asia Terrell was found in that Impala. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. In fact, there was no trace evidence at all found in that motorhome or in the uh, 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 Camaro. Same questions, same type of uh, search was done. No trace evidence belonging to Beresia Terrell at all in any of those vehicles, right? And she was in those vehicles, but there was none found by the FBI. You talked about the bleach at, uh, at the Clinton Walmart. Um, the bleach was discovered, was it not? That's a broad, I don't know what you're The asking. bottle of bleach was discovered. You're saying the bottle? Yes. There were two bottles purchased. Okay. Was a bottle of bleach discovered? There was a bottle of bleach discovered at the apartment. Now, when you brought the FBI in, they also brought their technology in that's allowing them to actually search an area to see if it's been cleaned with bleach, right? Where are you speaking of now? Any area at all. They have the, tech, the, the FBI has the technology to be able to look at a place through their technology and say, this particular place has been scrubbed with bleach. That did not happen here. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'm going to approach... Of this Credit Island thing, okay? This is a pair of 
Saskatchewan. Credit That's Island. close. Who took you to Credit Island and made Credit Island relevant to begin with? Detorious. It's on the DL? Yes. Okay. And how did he get there? With, with law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Physically tell the court what happened and how he got there. I wasn't along with that particular okay. drive. But I know he went with investigators, but I was not there for it. So you weren't there when you heard what he had to say and what went down there? Not on his first trip there, no. How about a second trip? I was with him on that, yes. And, uh, so you wrote to Detorious. Tell us, if you would, please, um, how Detorious uh, said things went down and how that impacted your investigation. He recognized the area just inside the roadway with the um, sort of pond-like area that had water in at that time. I'm pointing to this right here. It's the Mississippi River and some mines. Yes. Okay. So I guess what you don't understand is that all that white area here is, is river. Um, so the, the river backfills back into this little area where you see Mississippi River, and then that's not actually part of the flowing river. The actual river is up at the top. So this is just kind of backspill area that wraps around the, the island. Um, and there's, there's a little area uh, that you can drive off into where there's a, a bunch of gravel. At that particular time, there was uh, some road graders there, and they were restructuring some of that area. Um, but that area was an area he said he was at uh, with his dad. Did he say Bra Brazier was with him? No. What did he say his dad was doing there? He said he went uh, into the woods to pee. He said he took a machete with him. He saw him, from my recollection of that, he saw him uh, wipe one off in the trunk when he had come back. That's not always the story, the story though. He's changed stories, hasn't he? He does. That is the area where Briasia was recovered. Okay. And that's the most real-time photo we have, aerial photo, of around the time Briasia was recovered. It is. So now we have, as I count, one, two, three cars down there. It appears to be a boat, right? Yep. So that would be the day the uh, boat went out and tried to recover any evidence from the pond. Yes. So about a week after Briasia died? Yes. Was recovered, I'm sorry. I see there's a... One driveway that's kind of longer, and then there's that one that's just, just a little bit more to the uh, south, I think. Uh, yeah, we're kind of facing west a little bit. Okay. West is kind of towards your top on that one. Okay. So this is the much easier and more navigable driveway, the one I'm pointing to in the court, right? Yes, and it's better that day. Um, the road had been regraded slightly because the derecho had come in in between her disappearance and, and this day. So this road here kind of keeps maintained just a little bit, just I think for jeeps and stuff, right? I believe from just vehicle traffic knocking it down. But there's no shovel here with two-wheel drive vehicles getting down that road that day. Uh, so the silver car is mine, and it was a struggle getting out of there, but yeah, yeah we made it okay. Now, 
You okay? Yeah, you're okay. All right, you see the, the same driveway right here? Yes. That's the same long driveway you drove down, right? Yes. Okay, that's not the deep one. The deep one you can kind of see if you look right here. Right. Okay. So that's the one that's the you see all the time. All right, according to that second. So just to capture when we were there, it didn't appear anybody had driven down there any time recently. There were no – just beyond that. So it's all oh, high-grown grass down there. Sure. I'm not saying it's easy to use this one, but we need, a, we need something that someone would be using this driveway in the summertime. In the well, I wouldn't think ever. Um, and, and up here to the left, you'll see a, get some stuff on the – I'm going to call it the left side of the road. Mm -hmm. What is that? Uh, that is all from – just being up there, it's a bunch of um, recycled road concrete yeah, someone dumps fill. Stuff. Someone dumps stuff there, right? Yes, there was quite an impact from the derecho there. Yeah, a lot of uh, asphalt, broken concrete. Yeah, I, just, yeah, I would call it roadway materials or something put there for fill. Yeah, so you know who that is who does that? I do not know. Anybody interview who does that? No. It seems to be pretty heavily used, right? That gravel road? The, the, the dump spot. It had changed, yeah, in the year or so since I'd been there the last time. Okay. okay. So someone uses that enough to, to at least keep a pretty sizable dump pile. That would say. Okay, thank you. I can use the helmet. All right, Detective. Show me now State Exhibit 105. This is the, is this the website you put up or a flyer you put out asking for help? Yes. Okay. Um, when was that posted? I don't know the exact date off at this moment. Can you esti estimate for me? Uh, a week, a month? I, I don't know on this particular one. There were multiple media releases put out, and they are, were all contained within that web address. So as updates uh, became known, um, this would not, this particular one would not be immediate because of the positioning of uh, these vehicles and where they're at at that time. So how many media updates did you put out? How many flyers did you put up? As far as consistency in that, I, I do not know how many went. Our, our public relations people handled all of those details. Do you, can you indicate to me um, when the first would have gone out of any type? In the July 10th, there was information that was disseminated um, specifically that, that we had this missing person or missing child case. Okay. And on July 10th, did that uh, public post include Henry Dinkins' picture? I don't know without seeing it, what, what all the details around that one. It's fair to say that within a week, Henry Dinkins' picture is on the website, though, isn't it? Yes. And it's fair to say that Henry Dinkins' picture remained on that website and remained in the public view until Raja Terrell was found. Yes. And that made him a suspect? At that point, yes. Okay. And you had no other suspects, right? None. He was the focus of your investigation? Yes. Not an, one of these flyers included his mother or her mother, Bridges' mother, Aisha Langford. No, they did not. When you write reports uh, yourself, um, that's kind of policy in the Davenport Police Department, right? When you get information, you write a report. Or, or it's assigned to someone else or it's, it's notated where appropriate. Tell us what you did 
when you learned that Briasia Terrell's remains had been found? Did you have any responsibility, for instance, to tell Aisha? We communicated um, that there were remains found. Okay. Was there a detective who talked to or Aisha about where she was found? So I'm not sure on the timeline that you're speaking of because recovered remains were not identified as um, Briasia for, for several days. And Aisha had reached out to me once the media was propagating that there was remains found in Clinton. I, I did not have to find her. She found us. Well, there was a point where uh, you interviewed the child, DL, right? Correct. And the child, DL, story changed, didn't it? He had various versions of things, yes. Well, the last version he had was that he was present for the killing, right? He, he said something that he had heard that, yeah. He had said that he saw his father shoot his sister and that uh, Andrea had been there as well, hadn't, hadn't he? Yeah, I don't to that, that question, the way the question's phrased, it's suggesting that Andrea um, was, or not Andrea, Aisha was there when the child was shot, and I don't think counsel phrased it well. I said Andrea, I thought. I'll ask that you rephrase the question, please. He made a statement saying he was present when the his sister was shot, correct? Yes. He also said that, his, that Andrea Culberson was there when she was shot. Your Honor, if I could, I'm going to object to this line of questioning. The child has not testified. Counsel is attempt, attempting to impeach somebody who hasn't even got on the stand to testify, and this is inappropriate. Sustained. Did you write a report about the, uh, about the uh, interview with Notorious or DL? I believe so, yeah. If the prior county attorney, Mr. Walton, indicated to me that you had not, would that be comport with your recollection? He and I discussed it. I, I believe there was one done. Okay. Um, if we assume for a minute that the facts I just recited to you um, were in fact true, that is not in fact true, correct? Again, Your Honor, the state's going to object to this line of questioning. The child has not testified, and that testimony has not been offered. Sustained. These flip-flops we heard about earlier, um, what trace analysis was done on those? Which flip-flops? The ones that were found on Credit Island. There was nothing done with the ones on Credit Island because they weren't the color described to us. Okay. Uh, were there flip-flops found at the site where Briage's remains were found? Yes, it was. And those were the ones that more accurately were Briages? Yes. Subject to Ms. Cunningham's statement that this witness is subject to be recalled, I will uh, have no more questions this time. Ms. Cunningham. 
Thank you. Um, Sergeant Pfeiffer, let's go back to um, the video sh um, uh, surveillance footage collected from the quick shop. Um, at what time was um, uh, the defendant described arriving at the apartment with little Brigadier Terrell standing outside by the maroon Chevy Impala? With uh, seen, uh, I don't recollect the exact time. Okay. At any rate, does Andrea Culberson give us a specific time when they are at the apartment? She did provide okay. time. And then the video of the defendant at the quick shop, um, did that um, uh, event occur just shortly after he had been at the apartment and little Briasia Terrell had been standing out by the maroon Chevy Impala in the parking lot? Yes. All right. Um, and so was that a very short span time um, uh, from uh, um, when they were there at the apartment versus um, when he arrived at the quick shop? Yes. Okay. When Mr. Dinkins arrived at the quick shop, what vehicle was he um, operating? The maroon Chevy Impala. Was that the same vehicle that Briasia Terrell was noted standing by? Yes, it is. Um, uh, who, where did he um, park when he came into the quick shop parking lot? At the gas pump. Okay. And then so by virtue of that, with this being in the middle of the night um, and the tent on the windows being dark, um, uh, did the video surveillance give us any perspective of who may have been located inside that vehicle? Objection, narrative, and leading. Your Honor, it was not narrative. I just asked, did it give us a perspective? Could you see who was inside the vehicle? It was the 12 foot words okay. of order. I Ms. Cutting, I'll sustain the objection if you'd rephrase, please. I will, thank you. Um, what time of night would this have been when he arrived at the quick shop? Is that in the 3 o'clock in the morning time frame. Okay. Um, what would the lighting be like at that time of the day? The ambient, its light is dark. Okay. Um, were there specific um, characteristics um, that law enforcement had noted about the maroon Chevy Impala? It had tinted windows. Okay. And how dark was the tent? Dark enough, you could not see through it. Okay. Um, was the vehicle parked some dif distance from the quick shop itself, the actual store? Yes. Where was it parked? It was parked at the gas pump. Okay. Um, and then was there video surveillance feed that was collected that showed the vehicle parked at the gas pump? Yes, there was. Um, with the dark tint on the window, could um, uh, you see into that vehicle to see who was inside the vehicle? No, I cannot. All right. Um, and then was there video feed collected to show the defendant um, inside the quick shop? Yes. Okay. Um, and then did you have a chance to watch that video feed when he was inside the um, um, quick shop? I did. Um, and as you watched him inside the quick shop, was there something um, of interest to you as you observed his behavior? Yes. Describe. When the defendant was paying for his items, he... It was, it was noticeable that he continually looked out at his vehicle uh, while at the register. I don't know how many times, but it was a very frequent um, turning of the head to look out to the gas pumps and engage the clerk. And it, it appeared to be nervous behavior based off of watching a lot of video of people over the years. Uh, and, and I would take it to the point of he was walking out of the store without his change and considerable amount of money that he was uh, frantic and, and just walked away without collecting his change until prompted by the clerk. All right. Let's speak to the topic of um, investigator Tina, no Tina Noe over at the um, Rock Island PD. Was Tina Noe involved in this investigation at all? No. So would she have known any of the information that was gathered from witnesses that the Davenport Police Department was interviewing? No. Was she a part of the interview that was conducted of Andrea Culberson? No. Uh, was she a part of any interviews conducted of Andrea Culberson? No. Was she a part of any interviews conducted of Aisha Langford? No. Was she a part of any interviews conducted of DL? No. Um, was DL um, uh, driven um, around Davenport and even taken out to the area of Clinton to show law enforcement um, where he had traveled to with his father when his father picked him up in the early morning hours of July 10th? Yes, he was. Okay. Um, and then so was she in the vehicle when that happened? No. Okay. So did she have any investigative knowledge about the facts that were being gathered during the course of this investigation? No. Okay. Now, speaking to CS, um, how old is CS? At the time, I believe he was 12. Okay. Um, so at 12, um, uh, it, it, is, is this an individual, a child, who's even old enough to drive a vehicle? 
No. Okay. Um, and so then relative to um, what issues she was looking at, um, was this an issue that had occurred after um, what had happened with Briasia coming up missing? I don't know the time span of the particular instance she was Absolutely. speaking of. But at any rate, did this have any bearing on the investigation of Berisha Terrell missing? No. All right. Um, you know, much like the public calling in and offering up, you know, some information that they think might be helpful, is that simply what was happening with um, Investigator Noe? Yes, so. And, of course, um, you um, were involved in the investigation from the very beginning. Is that true? Yes, I was. And were you able to determine that um, the information that she was calling with was not, um, uh, had no bearing on this investigation? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's speak to the topic of Special Agent Rick Ron with the DCI. Now, did the DCI become involved fairly early on in this investigation? Yes, they did. All right. Um, what was Briasia Terrell identified as wearing when she went to bed that night? She was identified as wearing a large white T-shirt. Whose T-shirt was that? Henry Dinkins. What size of T-shirt did Henry Dinkins wear? 4X. And are we talking about a 4XL, a man's 4XL? Yes. All right. Is there a distinct difference between a man's um, a white 4XL T-shirt versus a youth's um, white T-shirt? Considerable difference. All right. Now, um, was there a homicide that had occurred in Clinton shortly after this situation with Briasia um, coming up missing? Yes, there was. All right. Um, did that particular homicide and the details of that homicide have any relationship whatsoever with the investigation involving Briasia Terrell? None. All right. Um, was law enforcement looking for clothing that Briasia would have been wearing when she came up missing? Yes. And in fact, when her remains were found, was there clothing found with her remains? Yes. What would that have included? A white 4X t-shirt. Okay. When um, uh, Special Agent Rick Ron um, was involved in the homicide there in Clinton, um, and he um, had gathered that youth-sized t-shirts together, um, is that something that law enforcement will do as a general rule? Yes. All right, and just, I think, to set up a perspective, when the canvassing was done out um, in the area of Clinton, um, were there various items that were located out in the fields? Yes. What types of items were located out in the field? Flip-flops, white T-shirts, socks, okay. white tank tops were pretty common. Were those all gathered? Some were. Yep. Um, and, and why would you gather it if um, it didn't appear to be relevant? To rule any possibilities out and to also remove it from where it was. Okay. Um, was there ever a cell phone that was found out in one of these canvases? Uh, there was. And just by way of example, um, was there follow-up on that cell phone to see if it might be connected connected to Henry Dinkins, Briasia Terrell, or any of the involved parties? Yes. All right. What was determined about that cell phone? No connection. Okay. In fact, um, was it determined to belong to a teenage girl? Yes. All right. Um, so does law enforcement um, uh, just paint with a broad brush, collect anything and everything, and determine what's relevant? We do. Okay. Was that T-shirt actually sent into the DCI lab with the DNA of Henry Dinkins? Yes, it was. All right. Were you involved in the collection of DNA from Henry Dinkins? No. Um, uh, on July 10th, did you... Let me rephrase that question. On July 10th, later on in the evening, was Henry Dinkins taken to Genesis Hospital um, for the collection of various samples? Yes, on that date. Were you involved in that? Yes, I was. Explain. <clears throat> there was a search warrant prepared to um, photograph and collect uh, any uh, biological trace evidence from the person of Henry Dinkins. Okay. Now, um, uh, Crime scene um, technician Jill Foster had indicated that there had been um, an earlier search warrant obtained um, to collect buccal swabs and swabs um, of his hands and underneath his fingernails. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, uh, we understand from her testimony that a decision was made not to do that because there was a decision to do the penal swabs as well? Correct. 
was there another search warrant obtained then so that all of that could be collected at one time? Yes. Did that happen at the hospital? Yes, it did. Was Henry Dinkins' DNA submitted to the DCI laboratory to be compared to um, any DNA that would have been collected of that, off of that child's youth T-shirt? Yes, it was. And, um, and did it come back that it was not his DNA? Correct. Now, I want to talk about the topics of the vehicles being searched um, and the uh, vehicles being processed for any type of blood or any type of DNA evidence. First of all, relative to processing the vehicles for DNA evidence, was Briasia Terrell in that black Dodge, Dodge Charger? It was a black Camaro. I mean, the black Camaro. Speaking? The black Camaro. Yes, she was. Was Briasia Terrell in that maroon Chevy Impala? Yes, she was. All right. So then, knowing that she was there, um, would there be any need to establish her DNA in there because we knew that she was there in the vehicle? Correct. Okay. Is the establishment of DNA something distinctly different from looking for any type of blood? Yes. All right. Um, during the morning hours of July 10th, after Henry Dinkins called Andrea... Or, I'm sorry, Aisha Langford at 8.08 a.m. to report that Briasia was missing. Did he go out to the apartment complex at Jersey Meadows? Yes, he did. Did he have some brief contact with a patrol officer out there? Yes, he did. Who was that patrol officer? Officer Burkle. Did he leave that apartment complex? Yes, he did. After he left that apartment complex, was his movements unaccounted for for the rest of the morning until he showed up at the Davenport Police Department? That's correct. Was that of concern to law enforcement that his movements were unaccounted for? Yes. And during that period of time when his movements were unaccounted for, had law enforcement seized the RV? Yes. No, prior to noon when he came down. Had no. law enforcement seized the RV? No. Had law enforcement seized the black Camaro? No. Had law enforcement seized the Chevy Impala? No. All right. Were those vehicles seized then later on in the day? Yes, they were. All right. With Mr. Dinkins going to Clinton and purchasing Clorox um, uh, around 7 a.m., was that concerning to law enforcement? Yes. All right. Now let's talk about um, the bottles of bleach. What size bottles of bleach did he buy at the Walmart in Clinton? Uh, I believe they're 80 or 82 ounce, okay. less than the gallon size. Okay. So is it the smaller bottles that we can now purchase? Yes. Okay. Um, was there a bottle of bleach located at um, Andrea Culberson's apartment there at Jersey Meadows? Yes. Okay. Was it the two smaller bottles of bleach or was it a larger bottle of bleach? And if you're not sure, should we red flag that and look for that? I, in I don't remember the exact size of that one. Okay. Um, at any rate, um, even during canvases that were conducted um, uh, out in Clinton and even around the area of Beresia Terrell, um, um, Terrell's remains, were there any bleach bottles located out there? Uh, there was one, yes. Okay. Um, and what did officers note about the size of that bleach bottle as compared to the bleach bottles that he had purchased at the Walmart in Clinton? It was a gallon jug. Okay. And so since it was larger, was it ruled out as being um, a, a bottle of Clorox that he would have purchased? Yes. Okay. Did you actually make a physical trip with D.L. so that the child could give some perspective of where he would have traveled with his father? Yes. Okay. Um, it, give us that perspective so that we know what you're talking about. Uh, Detective Hammes and I drove with DL um, up to the Clinton area to see if any of that area uh, was familiar with him. And as we were traveling down Highway 30, uh, he did recognize that as an area that he was in generally. And when um, we got to the Walmart, I, I wanted to verify with him that that was in fact uh, the Walmart that, that he was at for familiarity purposes. Okay, all right. Um, 
Let's talk about that dump pile um, here in state's exhibit number. Give that to me, Sergeant Piper. Can you see the exhibit number so I don't have to get up and walk over there? Forty-three. All right. So as we look to the bottom of the diagram, yeah, is that um, uh, where there was a lot of um, uh, debris, you know, that looked like concrete or stuff from roadways? It was. Yes. Uh, um, did you notice that there um, in July of this year when these images were collected? Yes. Um, was that the condition of that side of the road back in March of 2021? No. Okay. Um, and so um, did any of that concrete or debris exist at that point in time? No. Okay. Um, what had happened um, after July 10th? Um, uh, well, well, let me ask you this. Um, I, I'm going to back off that. Um, at some point in time, was there a major storm that had occurred? Yes. What was that storm? The storm was called a, a derecho, and that was in August of 2020. Okay. And then when um, Detorius, or, or I'm sorry, DL had pointed out um, the path his father had gone there on Credit Island, was that consistent with the area that the um, foot um, impressions were found in the dirt? Yes. Okay, I have no further questions. <coughs> okay. Mr. Fries. Detective, you uh, said the size 12 children's shirts were tested by DCI, right? The one that you spoke with with Special Agent Ron. And did not have Henry Dinkins' DNA on it, right? Correct. Whose DNA was found on it? It was unknown. Okay. And uh, just to clarify, that shirt was found 10 days post the disappearance of Briasia Terrell, right? Correct. And so, uh, Special Agent Ron thought it had some relevance to the disappearance because of location and timing, right? He didn't speak to relevance. He collected it because we were looking for white shirts. And he doesn't make business of wasting your time or giving you irrelevant evidence, right? We can agree on that? Agreed. The guy knows what he's doing, right? He does. He also knows that when children or people get kidnapped, they don't always get killed automatically, right? Correct. So maybe the uh, Briasia Terrell was not always wearing the size 4X T-shirt of Henry Dinkins. Maybe she changed clothes, right? Anything's possible. Right. So he was he was following down a possible lead, correct? If it would to turn into one, it was not a lead at that time. Okay. Um, when Briasia Terrell's body was was found. There was no DNA evidence of Henry Dinkins found on her, was there? No. Okay. And the county attorney here talked about DNA evidence and not finding it in the cars and stuff because we knew Briasia was there. But what's important was there's also a search done for blood evidence in those automobiles, and there was no blood evidence found, right? Correct. That's all I have. Okay. Sergeant Thank Piper. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Piper, um, uh, when Briasia Terrell was found, um, the environment that she was found in, what's significant about that? With respect to the environment, it was out in the open weather. Uh, her, her body would have been exposed to the elements um, up until... Uh, that particular time, which was just after the snow cap had melted. And when her body was found, describe the condition of her body. It's fairly disturbing. Um, her, most of her body was just uh, skeletal bones, um, with the exception of her, her right leg. Uh, had some mummified skin uh, still attached to it. With DNA then being subjected to the elements, do elements destroy things like DNA? Yes, it does. I have no further questions. No further. You may 
based on uh, this time, uh, it appears that you may be recalled. Uh, you're still under the admin that I issued earlier. Thank you. Ms. Cunningham, we are going to take our morning break. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we'll be in adjournment until approximately 11.05. Thank you.
Ms. O'Donnell, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Alicia Fritz. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? Alicia Fritz, A-L-Y-C-I-A-F-R-I-T-Z. And how are you currently employed? As a crime, civilian crime scene technician with the Davenport Police Department. How long have you worked in this capacity with the Davenport Police Department? Since October of 2017. What exactly is a civilian crime scene technician? So my main job duties are responding to crime scenes, uh, documenting those crime scenes by taking photographs and searching for, identifying, collecting um, items of evidence. And I also process evidence in the laboratory, uh, mostly for fingerprints and sometimes swabbing for DNA, collecting trace evidence. Since civilian is in your title, does that mean you're not a certified peace officer? Correct. Can you briefly describe your educational background and any training that you would have received for your position? Yes, in 2009, I graduated from Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan with a a Bachelor of Science degree in Forensic Biology. And regarding training, when I started with the Davenport Police Department, I did a four-month in-house training program with three different civilian crime scene technicians. And over the years during my employment, I've attended various um, trainings related to crime scene processing. Now, Ms. Fritz, when you are called to a crime scene, can you explain generally the process that you would follow once you first arrive? So generally, I try and meet with officers if they're on scene or with a complainant, try and gather some information, kind of figure out a game plan, um, and then typically take photos if necessary, and then search for or process for any items of evidence. Now, back on July 17th of 2020, were you working in the same capacity? Yes. At some point, were you dispatched to 2744 East 53rd Street, apartment number 8? Yes. Do you recall approximately what time that would have been? Uh, if I could refer to my report, I could let you know. Would referring to your report help, help you refresh your memory? Yes. May she refer to her report, Your Honor? She may. Uh, approximately 18.51 hours. And is that 6.51? Correct, 6.51 p.m. And why, what was the purpose of being dispatched to that residence? I was asked to meet with detectives um, who were going to search the residence for items of possible evidence, and they asked that I take photographs of the apartment and assist with collecting evidence. Now, again, this was July 17th of 2020, correct? Correct. Now, to your knowledge, had detectives and other search warrants already been executed on July 10th for this same residence? To my knowledge, yes. And photographs and items had been collected at that time? Yes. Um, but again, you were being asked to go back for further processing? Yes. So once you arrived at that location, how did you begin processing that apartment again? I started by taking photographs. Uh, fair to say that you took a lot of photographs? Yes. Uh, during the course of that search warrant as well, is it fair to say that you would have collected a fair amount of items? Yes. Uh, may I approach your honor? You may. handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 418 through 427, 
take a look at those and tell me if you recognize those exhibits. Yes, I did. And did it fairly and accurately depict those items that you would have taken photos of? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer exhibits for 18 through 427 into evidence. So again, those uh, exhibits will be admitted. And may the state publish? You may. Starting with State's Exhibit 418, can you tell us generally what area of this apartment we're in that's being depicted in the photograph? It's the kitchen area. And specifically, what were you trying to photograph in this picture? This one was just a general overview. Then directing you to State's Exhibit 419, what is being photographed here? That would be a bottle of bleach. And what was the significance of taking this photograph? I was asked specifically to document this by detectives. Showing you then State's Exhibit 420. What's being depicted here? That's a broom. And why were you taking a photograph of this broom? Again, it was something that was directed to me by detectives to document. Now, while you were in this apartment, did you conduct any further processing on this item, this broom? Yes. And what processing would you have done? I applied luminosity to the broom. And what is luminosity? Luminosity is a chemical we use to help search for blood evidence that's either extremely diluted or has been cleaned up. And how does that work exactly? So the chemical reacts with the iron and blood, and it will luminesce or glow a blue color. And when you're looking for some sort of luminesce or a blue color, are you able to determine yourself, yes, that is blood that I'm seeing? No. Uh, why not? So this chemical isn't specific to blood. It can actually react with some other items. Uh, so... It's essentially a screening tool used by law enforcement to try to pinpoint items that may have blood on them. Correct. So after photographing and then using the luminosity on this broom, did you collect this item as well? Yes. Um, after collecting that item, what would you have done with it? I would have sealed the item and uh, submitted it to our property and evidence. Showing you then state's exhibit... 421. Uh, what are we looking at here? This is an overview of the mattress in the bedroom. And at the time that this photograph had been taken, um, it, it's a little hard to see on the photograph, but had you had already looked in, at this mattress to try to determine whether you observed any sort of stains or items of evidence? Yes, I did in this photograph. And again, what sort of process would you have gone through to try to observe those items? So in this case, I just did a visual search um, with my eyes looking for stains. Um, I also used an alternate light source to look for possible blood or bodily fluid evidence. And if you had seen anything either visually with your eyes or with the alternative light source, did you then mark it using stickers? Correct. And are you able to observe... Some of those stickers at least in this photograph yes after marking those uh, specific places where you had made some sort of observation how did you proceed then with this item so various stains that appeared dark um, my thought process was it could possibly be blood um, so i tested them 
um, with a presumptive test. Um, they all came back negative. Um, and then some of the stains fluoresced using the alternate light source, and ultimately those stains were collected as evidence. How did you collect those stains? The stains were cut away from the mattress using sterile scalpels. Showing you states exhibit 422. What are we looking at in this picture? This is an overview of the toilet in the bathroom and the, it had been marked with an evidence sticker. Why had the toilet been marked with an evidence sticker? I located a reddish stain on the toilet seat. And did you do any further processing with that stain? while you were at this residence? Yeah, I swabbed it, uh, the stain, and collected it for evidence. Showing you State's Exhibit 423. What are we looking at here in this photograph? This is an overview of the drain area of the bathtub in the bathroom that has been marked with an evidence marker. And why was the bathtub marked with an evidence marker. So this area I had also applied the luminosity and there was a blue reaction and so I swabbed that area. Again does that blue reaction mean there's potentially blood in that area? Potentially. And you then took a swab of that area? Correct. States Exhibit 424. Again, what are we being shown here? This is an overview of the top of the sink in the bathroom, and it has also been marked with an evidence marker. And why was this item marked with an evidence marker? The top area of the sink had a reaction with the luminosity. And after that reaction, what would you have done at that time? Again, I swabbed the area to collect as evidence. States Exhibit 425, what's being depicted in this photograph? That's an overview of the top of the toilet in the bathroom that's been marked with an evidence marker. And why was this item marked with an evidence marker? Again, the top of the toilet had a reaction with the luminosity. And how would you have proceeded at that time? I also swabbed this area uh, to collect as evidence. The States Exhibit 426. What's being shown here? It's an overview of the toilet uh, seat area that's also been marked with an evidence marker. And why was the toilet seat marked with an evidence <coughs> marker? There was a positive reaction with luminosity. And would you have taken a swab of the toilet seat as well? I did. Showing you States Exhibit 427. That's the bottom an overview of the bottom molding area along the bathtub in the bathroom that's been marked with an evidence marker. And why was the molding marked with an evidence marker? It was, had a positive uh, reaction with the luminosity. And did you take a swab of that area as well? Yes. After taking swabs of all those areas in the bathroom, what would you have done with the swabs? Uh, packaged, sealed, and submitted to our property and evidence. When you say swab, were you taking individual swabs of each of those areas we just saw in those photographs? Each of those areas would have been swabbed with two swabs, which is a rule per our state lab, um, but each of those areas was swabbed individually and packaged separately. Following the execution of the search warrant then at that particular residence, on July 20th of 2020, uh, were you asked to, or dispatched to, uh, an evidence processing center uh, to look at a Chevy Impala? Yes. And why were you dispatched to that area? I was asked to process the exterior of the vehicle for fingerprints. What is the process you follow for trying to obtain some sort of fingerprint from an item? Depends on the situation. Um, in this case, I did overview photographs and I 
dusted the entire exterior of the vehicle using black graphite powder and then searched for what appeared to be fingerprints and then lifted those areas uh, with tape, put them onto latent print cards, and collected them for evidence. Now, to your knowledge, had search warrants already been executed on this particular vehicle by the FBI? Yes. Um, why were you then asked to follow up again to attempt to locate any fingerprints? I was advised by Sar uh, Sergeant Pfeiffer that he did not believe the exterior of the vehicle had been processed by the FBI for fingerprints. Would you have documented that vehicle uh, by taking photographs prior to any examination for fingerprints? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Handing you what has been marked as these exhibits 4 1 through 4 17. Could you please look through those and let me know if you recognize those exhibits? Yes. And what are those exhibits? These are photographs that I took of the vehicle. And do they fairly and accurately depict the condition of the vehicle on July 20th of 2020? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer exhibits 4, 1 through 418 into evidence. Okay. Those exhibits will be admitted. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. I'm going to show you <clears throat> State's Exhibit 4-9. What are we being shown here? This was an area of ridge detail that I had found or a fingerprint that I had marked with evidence marker 1. Uh, do you make any other observations in this photograph as well? Just that I see some dry dirt near it. Now, when you have looked at uh, evidence exhibit item number one, you identify those fingerprints or potential fingerprints, how do you then proceed? I used a clear tape, uh, lifted the fingerprint, placed it onto a fingerprint card. And what do you do with that fingerprint card once you place the tape on there? So we fill out the card with information such as the case number, where we lifted it from, uh, where the location is that we're at collecting the fingerprints, and we do a small diagram on it showing the location of the fingerprint. Ultimately, how many different areas on the vehicle were identified as having potential fingerprints? There were eight. So once you collect, or did you collect all eight of those um, areas or try to collect fingerprints like you did with item number one with the tape and placing it on a card? Yes, all were collected the same way. So once you're done then looking for those fingerprints on the vehicle, you've collected those cards, what do you do with them at that time? They were packaged, sealed, and submitted to property and evidence. Would you yourself do any further processing with those fingerprints? No. Ms. Fritz, I'd like to direct your attention then to March 22nd of 2021. Um, on that day, 
were you dispatched to Clinton County to 270th Avenue, um, kind of just north of 218th Street in Clinton County? Yes. And why were you dispatched to that area? I was requested to respond due to human remains being found. And when you arrived on that scene, uh, what were you asked to do at that time? I was asked by Sergeant Pfeiffer to document the area and the remains that were found. And do you recall approximately what time of day it was that you would have uh, responded to that area? It was evening time. I would need to refer to my report for a specific time. How do you know that it was evening time? I just remember it was dark out. How well were you able to see at that time? Uh, generally well. There were some extra lighting set up um, by Clinton County officers. Sort of like stadium lights? Yes. If those lights had not been set up, would it have been more difficult to observe the area? Yes. So you were asked to photograph or take photographs of that scene at that time. Were you asked to do any further processing? I was asked to not do any further processing besides photographs. And why were you asked to not do any further processing at that time? I was told that the state lab would actually be responding the next day to process the scene. So while you were on the scene yourself, uh, were you asked to photograph the area surrounding the remains? Yes. And specifically branches uh, that were around the remains? Yes. Why were you asked to photograph those branches? It was pointed out to me that several branches surrounding the remains appeared maybe broke or cut. Or cut. And additionally, were you asked to photograph a flip-flop that was found? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's been marked as state's exhibits 428 through 440. Could you please take a look at those exhibits and let me know if you recognize them? <laughs> Yes. And what are these exhibits? These are photographs that I took on scene. And do they fairly and accurately depict the condition of this area, the branches, the flip-flop on March 22nd, 2021? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer exhibits 428 through 440 into evidence. Okay. Those exhibits will be admitted. You may approach, Your Honor. You may. Ms. Fritz, this is State's Exhibit 428. Uh, what is being shown here in this photograph? That would be an overview of some of the branches very close to where the remains were. I'm showing you this is State's Exhibit 430. What's being shown here? A close-up of one of the branches. 
in States Exhibit 432. Another close-up of one of the branches. Again, what was the significance of taking photographs of these branches? Just showing that there was some sort of disturbance, possibly, that had happened to them. Thirty-six. Another close-up of one of the branches. Again, did the branch itself appear to have been cut? I would say possibly. Then states exhibit 439. It's an overview of the flip-flop on the ground. And states exhibit 4. 40. What are we being shown here? A close-up of the flip-flop on the ground. And are you able to make any observations of the color of that flip-flop? In my report, I referred to it as teal and white. And Ms. Fritz, uh, other than those three different areas that we had talked about where you had taken photographs. Does that essentially conclude your involvement with this investigation? Yes. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Waters, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I want to start, I'll just do a, a very brief overview of all, th all three of these uh, things that we've discussed. I'll start with July 17th of 2020. I think you mentioned that uh, you had gone to this apartment uh, at about 6.50 p.m., right? Correct. Uh, we looked through a few photos that you took, and one of them that stands out is a picture of bleach. You took that photo, right? Yes. Uh, did you touch the bottle at all? I would have handled it some way wearing gloves. Okay, and then, just for my knowledge, I imagine you were wearing gloves at all three of these locations. Yes. Right? Okay, and then could you tell me whether or not that, that bleach bottle had been used at all? Did you open it up or manipulate it in any way? The only thing I did was I used a hemostix, which is a presumptive blood test, on a very tiny brown stain that was on the side. Other than that, I didn't do anything further with it. Okay, and then I'll be very brief about all of these pictures that you had, or you took. Uh, you talked about a broom, a toilet seat, the top of the toilet, the brim or the rim of the toilet, a bathtub, a bathroom sink, and a molding area. All of those items were in that bathroom, right? Other yes. than Other than the broom? Yes. Okay. And after taking pictures of these and after looking at all these stains, essentially, and all those items, uh, you essentially just submitted them to the evidence and property team, right? Correct. Okay. And you would have had uh, no involvement in testing those stains, correct? Correct. Okay, so you couldn't tell me whether it was blood or semen or any other bodily fluid on those on those items. Correct. Okay. When you were in the bathroom, uh, could you smell bleach? I don't recall any sort of strong odor of bleach or anything specific. Okay, so bleach didn't stand. The smell of bleach didn't stand out to you at all mm. in that bathroom. No. How about in the apartment at all? No. 
but again, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have been involved in testing any of those stains, correct? Correct, just collecting the swabs. Then I want to talk about uh, July 20th of 2020, uh, where you uh, showed up and you, you, you took some fingerprints and photographs of the Chevy Impala, right? Correct. What time of day was that again? And if you don't remember, I don't care if you look at your report. I would have to refer to my report. Go ahead. If that's okay. <clears throat> Uh, 16, 20 hours, so 4, 20 p.m. Okay, so sometime in the afternoon. Yes. Okay. And then you go through this process of photographing and, and dusting and getting fingerprints, correct? And then you, you put those documents, those photographs, then the fingerprints of the dusts, and you just give them to the property and evidence team, right? Correct. Again, you would have no involvement in testing these fingerprints, correct? Correct. So you couldn't tell me whose fingerprints they belong to, right? Correct. You couldn't tell me whether it was an adult or a child. Correct. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned that you had or saw some dirt uh, on the side of the Impala, correct? Correct. I think your words were it was dried dirt, right? Correct. You didn't take a sample of that dirt, right? Correct. Okay. And then you would have obviously, it begs the question, you would have, wouldn't have tested that dirt. Correct. Okay. Then on March 22nd of 2021, took some pictures out at the Kunau implement, right? Correct, in that area. Okay. Uh, and you took some pictures of some, some sticks and then a flip flop, correct? Correct. Last question, you couldn't tell me who's flip-flops those belong to, correct? Correct. And that's simply because you didn't take the flip-flop and test it for DNA, fingerprints, anything of the like? Correct, just photographs. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. O'Donnell. Just briefly, Your Honor. Ms. Fritz, showing you here State's Exhibit 418. This bottle of bleach that you see on top of the water bottle, when you had arrived at the apartment there, was that exactly where it was once you first walked in? That's where you saw it? I believe so. Okay. Uh, and so, to your knowledge, you yourself did not do anything with that bottle of bleach. You just walked in and that's where it was. Correct. Great. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Nothing further. You may step down. then it would be appropriate to break for lunch then if the witness would take approximately the same length of time uh, at this time then we'll adjourn for lunch we'll reconvene at 1 30. thank you
Ms. O'Donnell, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Dustin Garner. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Please have a seat. Can you please state and spell your name? Dustin Garner, D-U-S-T-I-N-G-A-R-N-E-R. -E How are you currently employed? With the Davenport Fire Department. How long have you worked for the Davenport Fire Department? Just under two and a half, two years. Prior to your employment with the Davenport Fire Department, where were you employed? The Davenport Police Department. In total, how long did you work for the Davenport Police Department? Just under six years. Prior to your employment with the Davenport Police Department, did you work anywhere else in law, enforce, law enforcement? I also worked for the city of Muscatine as a police officer for four years, and I was a military police officer in the Army for eight. So back in July of 2020, were you still working for the Davenport Police Department at that time? Yes, I was. And did you have a particular position with the police department? I was a detective assigned to the Special Victims Unit. How long did you work as a detective with the Special Victims Unit? Approximately one year. Prior to that assignment with the Special Victims Unit, did you hold other positions within the Davenport Police Department? I was a patrol officer for a good number of years. I was also a member of the Emergency Services Team. I was a uh, officer crime scene tech for night shift. I was a field training officer as well. Part of your duties when you were employed as an officer crime scene tech, uh, or what would your duties have been at that time? Uh, documentation, collection, photographing, processing crime scenes. And did you re receive any specialized training in, in order to do those parts of your position? Yes. And as a detective, uh, were you sometimes called on to utilize that training, uh, even though you're now at, at the time working as a detective? Yes. Okay. So back on July 20th, excuse me, July 10th of 2020, at some point were you dis dispatched to 2744 East 53rd Street, apartment number 8 in Davenport, Iowa? Yes, I was. Why were you dispatched there? I was sent to assist with the service of a, service of a search warrant at that residence. And did you assist with the service of that search warrant? Yes, I did. What does that process look like? knock on the door, announce ourselves, who we are, that we're the police department, we have a search warrant for the scene, secure the residence, anyone inside, the people, uh, subjects inside the residence are typically interviewed by one or more detectives that are on scene or other officers, and then overall documentation, photographs are taken, and a search is conducted of the residence. And back on July 10th, 2020, before you and other officers began searching this apartment, uh, to your knowledge, were overall photographs taken at that time? Yes. And during that search, any items that were uh, seized and collected, to your knowledge, were those items photographed as well? Yes. Do you recall who would have photographed those items? Some of the items were initially photographed by myself and others would have been CST Stovall. Now, while you were at this location, at some point did you have contact with Aisha Lankford? Not at that residence, I don't believe so. At some point, um, were you or did Aisha show you her phone? Yes, I believe that was in the parking lot outside of the residence. 
So at the apartment complex, just not inside? Correct. Okay. And why did Aisha show you her phone? I believe it was to show a call log with Henry Dinkins. And is that something she voluntarily did? Yes. Did you take photographs of that call log? Yes, I did. Additionally, did she show you any text messages as well? Yes. Did you photograph those text messages? Yes, I did. And again, did she voluntarily show you those text messages? Yes, she did. Were the text messages that she showed you, again, between herself and Henry Dinkins? I believe so, yes. May I approach your honor? You may. Showing you what's been marked as states exhibit seven one through seven eleven. Could you please take a look at those and tell me if you recognize those exhibits? Yes, I do. And what are states exhibit 7 1 through 7 11? These are photographs as captured with my department issued cell phone of Aisha's phone. And do they fairly and accurately depict the call logs that she voluntarily showed you between herself and Henry Dinkins and the text messages um, on July 10th, 2020? Yes, the ones that were on our phone, correct. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer Exhibit 711, excuse me, 71 through 711 into evidence. I would object on the ground of hearsay and foundation or improper foundation. The objection's overruled. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. Showing you first states exhibit seven one. What uh, is being shown in this photograph here? This is a contact for it states Tatoria's daddy. And is that how Aisha related to you was the contact name she had for Henry Dinkins in her phone? Yes, it was. To your knowledge, did Aisha Langford and Henry Dinkins share a child? Yes. Do you know the child's name? Yes, Tutorius. So showing you then states exhibit 7-2. What's being depicted here in this photograph? That would have been the call log for July 10th under the Tutorius day. Does it show both incoming and outgoing calls and the times associated with those phone calls? Yes, it does. Showing you then States Exhibit 7 3. What are we looking at in this photograph? 
that would be a text message history. Um, and again, is this the same contact to Tori's and Daddy? Yes. And from looking at the messages, are you able to decipher which of the messages appear to be sent from this phone versus the messages that were received to this phone? Yes. And how do you make that determination? Honestly, the different colorings. And what are you able to tell us about the coloring of the messages? Both persons sent messages back and forth between the two. So the messages that appear green, um, do those appear to be messages sent from this phone? Yes. And the messages appearing in gray, do those appear to be messages that somebody would have sent to this phone? Yes. Showing you then States Exhibit 7-4, what's being shown here? A further continuation of that text message history. Now, specifically referring to, and I don't know how well you can see this on the screen, some text messages that appear to be sent, it says yesterday at 9.13 p.m. Yes. Was there a message sent to this phone at approximately that time? Yes, there was. What does that message say? Good night, Mom. And was there a response message sent, you can see, in green? Yes, I can't read what it is, but... I approached with this. Does that help you in order to read that? Yes, it says, good night, I love you, Bree, and Dink. And States Exhibit 7-5. Uh, again, what are we looking at here? A further continuation of that text message thread. And... Labeled there at the top, there appears to be a, a timestamp that says today at 8.08 a.m. Did this phone receive a message at approximately that time? Yes, it did. And what did that message say? Call me. And was there a response sent in green? Just call me. I'm not about to play telephone. And then at approximately 9.36 a.m., did this phone appear to send a photograph? Yes. Are you familiar with who is in that photograph? Yes. Who is that? Briasia. So showing you then States Exhibit 7-7, seven, seven. what is being depicted here? That would have been the call history as captured on the phone. So previously... In States Exhibit 7-2, there was also a call history listed there. What's the difference between States Exhibit 7-2 and 7-7? Uh, 7-7 is the overall contact history, or call history for the phone. 7-1, I believe it was, 7 is, 7-2 is strictly the history for the contact to Toria's daddy. And so while you were speaking with Aisha, again, she voluntarily showed you her entire call log that morning. Yes, she did. And, and that was one photograph taken in States Exhibit 7-7, 7-8, 7, 7, 7 8. <coughs> What are we looking at here? Again, the overall call history for the phone. Then 7-9, again, just a continuation of that call history? Yes. 7-10. A further continuation. So in order to 
capture the continuation? You have had the phone and been just scrolling through the call logs. Yes, I would leave the last one or two calls from the previous photo at the top of the screen or bottom, depending on which way it scrolled, to show that it was a continuous roll of the actual call history. And then the last photograph taken, 711, again, just a continuation of those calls. Yes. And again, Aisha Lankford was voluntarily letting you do that. Yes, she was. Now, also on July 10th, at some point, were you sent to Danita Gardner's house? Yes, I was. And in relation to Aisha Langford, who is Danita Gardner? I believe she is her mother. And why were you sent to Danita Gardner's house? I was informed that I needed to pick up two bags of clothing that had been left there. And once you arrived at that location, were you able to uh, observe those bags of clothing? Yes, I was. And what did you do at that time? I believe I took overall photographs of both and then immediately transported them back to uh, the apartment where I then turned them over to CST Stovall. And did CST Stovall take additional photographs of those items? I believe she would have, yes. And Detective Gardner, Gardner, excuse me, uh, what was the significance of those two bags of clothing? I believe they were clothing belonging to Briasia. that point, um, at least to your knowledge, did you have any further information on the significance of that clothing at that time? No, I did not. You were just told to go pick them up and you did? Yes. Did you yourself make any observations of the clothing and how it appeared? No, I just collected the bags and took them straight to the CST. On July 20th of 2020, um, at some point then, were you sent to the Davenport uh, fire, fire training facility? Yes, I was. Why were you sent to that location? I was sent to escort a maroon Impala to Public Works. Explain what you mean by escort uh, and the Impala to Public Works. Once arriving there, I unlocked the facility that it was in. It was a secured facility. You had to have access to be able to get in. I verified that the evidence seals on the Impala were still intact from when they'd been placed in there last, and I photographed those. I was there when the vehicle was then loaded onto a flatbed truck from Fred's towing, and then I stayed directly behind that vehicle the entire route we took all the way back to Public Works. I had never lost visual sight of that vehicle at all. And then once arriving at Public Works, I again verified that the evidence seals were intact. Why was the vehicle transferred to Public Works? We were going to drop the gas tank off of it to measure how much fuel was left inside. And did that require placing the vehicle on a device that could lift, lift the vehicle? Yes, it made it significantly easier to remove the gas tank. And did you have the capacity to do that at the Public Works building? Yes. And what was the point of removing the gas tank from this vehicle? In my understanding, it was to measure the amount left so we could gauge 
approximate distances that vehicle had been traveled since it had last been refueled. Were you present then when the vehicle was raised on the lift? Yes, I was. And at that time, did you make any additional observations of that uh, maroon Impala? Yes, I did. Once the vehicle was raised, uh, stuck in the undercarriage was a few spots of what appeared to be soil and grass stuck in the undercarriage of the vehicle where it normally would not be. Did you find anything odd about that? It would, the vehicle would have needed to be driven off road to get dirt and grass in those areas. At the time that you made those observations, how did you then proceed? I then called my supervisor, Sergeant Piper, and informed him of what I had found. And how did you then proceed with the vehicle at that point in time? I, again, stayed with the vehicle, and we waited until a search warrant had been drafted to collect samples from the vehicle. After that search warrant was obtained, um, did somebody arrive to then collect soil samples from that vehicle? Yes, it would have been CST John Vance. I should also add in that I also took photographs of the undercarriage of the vehicle with the dirt intact before being disturbed. So prior to CST Vance's arrival, you took your own photographs? Yes. Once CST Vance arrived, did he take additional photographs as well? I believe so, yes. Were you present when he took those photographs? Yes. At that point, what did you observe CST Vance do? He had donned gloves and he collected soil samples from the different areas on the bottom of the car. Did you observe where he had collected those soil samples from the undercarriage of the vehicle? Yes. And once the samples were collected, I watched him put them inside a manila envelope. Where then did he take those soil samples from the undercarriage? It's my understanding he transported them back to the police department. And let me clarify, when you observed him collecting the soil samples from the vehicle, you'd previously testified that you watched him do that, correct? Correct. And you were able to determine where on the vehicle he collected those soil samples? Yes. Where on the vehicle then did he collect those soil samples? From the undercarriage. And what did he do then with the soil samples once he collected them? Secured them in his vehicle before, I believe, transporting them to the police department. I believe you previously testified he placed them in a manila envelope? Yes. And then he placed that envelope securely in his vehicle? Yes. Before he transported them to the Davenport Police Department? Yes. His vehicle had been pulled into the parking garage, so it was right next to where we were working. After the soil samples were collected and placed in CST Vance's vehicle, were there steps then taken to remove the gas tank? Yes. How did you go about doing that? Uh, the main, we'll call it mechanic for lack of a better word at this point, lowered the actual gas tank. Once the gas tank was down on the ground, we then siphoned all of the gas from the tank to get an approximate measurement of how, or to get an exact measurement of how much was left in the tank. So when you say siphon the gas out of that tank, essentially was it poured into some sort of bucket? I believe we used tubing and a siphon to pull it out.
that point, then, were you able to determine how much gas had been left in that tank at the time? Yes. And do you recall how much gas? I would like to double check my report to give you the exact number. Would re reviewing your report help refresh your memory? Yes. May we re review his report? You may. It was four gallons and 47 ounces. And to your knowledge, was that process um, also photographed by CST Vance? Yes, he took photographs of the fuel ones that had been taken out and I believe the empty fuel tank. And that was something you observed him doing? Yes. Your Honor. You Handing you first what's marked as State Exhibit 43. Uh, do you recognize this item? Yes. Uh, and what is State Exhibit 143? Uh, it is a manila, manila envelope containing the what I believe to be the soil samples collected from the underside of the maroon Impala. And the State Exhibit 143 appears to be the same soil samples you observed. Uh, CST Vance collect from the undercarriage of the Maroon Impala on July 20th, 2023, and then placed into this envelope. Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer Exhibit 143 into evidence. I have no Exhibit 143 will be admitted. Handing you next, State Exhibit 18-1. Eighteen six. I'm also going to hand you then state exhibit. 18-1 through 18-6, did you recognize those items? Yes. And what are those? Those are photos that I took of the maroon Impala and the soil on the underside of the car. And states exhibit 19-1 through 19-13, uh, 
did you recognize the items in those photographs as well? Yes. And what did you recognize in those photographs? The same vehicle, the fuel from the tank, the debris or the soil on the bottom of the car, and the empty gas tank. And in both 18.1 through 18.6 and 19.1 through 19.13, uh, do those photographs fairly and accurately depict the soil and dirt on the undercarriage observed by yourself on July 20th, 2020, as well as then the gas that would have been removed and siphoned into um, on the cloud bucket? on July 20th, 2020? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state would offer exhibits 18-1 through 18-6 and 19-1 through 19-13 into evidence. Those exhibits will be admitted. I have one more to ask you about. Uh, this is state's exhibit 18-6. Do you recognize that item as well? Yes, I do. And what is State's Exhibit 18-7? This is another photo of the underside of the vehicle that was taken with my department-issued cell phone. And again, does this fairly and accurately depict that soil on the undercarriage of the Impala on July 20th, 2020? Yes, it does. We also move to admit 18-7 into evidence. Exhibit 18-7 will be admitted. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. Starting here with State's Exhibit 18-1. What's being shown here? The rear license plate and a partial angle of the underside of that maroon Impala. Showing you 18-2. That is an overall the underside of that same maroon Impala. This 18-4. What's being shown here? The underside of the maroon Impala. This is State's Exhibit 18-5. Again, what's being shown here? The underside of the maroon Impala. Then 18-6. Again, the underside of the maroon Impala. And specifically, what are you, were you trying to capture when you were taking these photographs of the undercarriage? The dirt and grass stuck in the, what appears to be metal of the underside of the vehicle. Showing you State's Exhibit 19-5. What, what's being shown here? That is another section of the soil and grass on the underside of the vehicle captured by CST Vance's camera. Nineteen six. A different spot on the undercarriage, but the same as 19.5 was. Nineteen seven. The same as the previous two. More soil and dirt and grass. Yes, more soil and dirt and grass. Showing you then State's Exhibit 1910. What are we looking at here? That was the first bucket used filled up to 128 ounces of fuel from the tank that was dropped from the Impala. And then this is State's Exhibit 1911. What's being shown here? A bucket with approximately 47 ounces of fuel left in it. This 
State's Exhibit 1912, what is being shown here? This is the empty gas tank that was dropped off of the Maroon Impala after having the fuel siphoned out, as well as the two green buckets that the fuel was then dumped into out of the measuring bucket. After the gas tank was removed from this vehicle, uh, was the Impala lowered to the ground? After the fuel tank was then replaced, yes. Okay. So you replaced the fuel tank and then it was lowered to the ground? Yes. Uh, did you stay then with the Impala and observe any further processing of that vehicle at that time? Yes, I then escorted the Impala back to the secured facility it had been in earlier that day. Um, after that vehicle, the Impala, was lowered back to the ground, is that when CSD Fritz would have then uh, attempted to locate any latent fingerprints on the vehicle? Yes. Were you also present then when she would have photographed the vehicle and made any observations of that during that time? Yes. Showing you then what's been previously admitted as State's Exhibit 4-3, Um, do you observe any dirt on this portion of the vehicle that's being shown? Appears to be some on the rear lower quarter panel. And would you agree this is the passenger side of the vehicle? Yes. This is State's Exhibit 4-4. Four, four. Again, do you observe any dirt or mud in, again, on the passenger side of the vehicle in this photograph? Road dust and the like, but no major spots. Then on State's Exhibit 4 or 5, again, fair to say this is the driver's side of the vehicle? Yes. Does there appear to be less mud or dirt on the driver's side of this vehicle than on the passenger side that we previously just looked at? Yes. Detective Gardner, uh, your other involvement uh, in this investigation, it's fair to say that you would have retrieved a lot of surveillance video. Yes. Uh, any other involvement then after that, essentially? As far as entering electronic evidence and things like that, yes. Um, followed up on a few tips, yes. Uh, did any of the tips you followed up on turn out to be related at all to this case? No. All right, thank you. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Waters. Sir, I want to start with talking about uh, July 10th of 2020. I think you had mentioned you had gone to uh, the Jersey Meadow Apartments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you spoke with Aisha Langford, uh, and you got, took these pictures of her phone, right? Yes. Now, <clears throat> these text messages that we saw uh, in this phone call log, uh, you took those pictures and then uh, those are the exhibits that we just looked at, right? Correct. Okay. You couldn't tell me whether there were any text messages deleted or any phone calls deleted from uh, that phone call log, could you? No. Okay. And then... I want to focus on July 20th, on 20, 2020, when uh, you're transporting this Impala back and forth. Just just so I understand, where was the Impala before you had, had brought it over to this uh, place where it was, it was observed? From where, where it was stored, you mean? From where to where? 
Uh, that at the time was uh, the fire department training center in a secured garage. Okay, where is the fire department training center? It is no longer there. It was on West 83rd by where Wacky Waters used to be. Okay, is it full of gravel and dirt and mud? No. Okay. It was a concrete poured floor with metal walls. And how was it transported there, if you know? On a flatbed. Okay, did you observe Tow truck. it being transported to... I would have to refer to my reports on that one to verify. Just from your memory, do you remember being it transported to that place prior to you transporting it or watching it being transported to the next place? Yes, it was transported on a flatbed. Our policy is that we do not use a towed behind the, a tow behind tow truck. We want the vehicle up off of the road so there is no road dust that kicks up from the tires onto the undercarriage. Is it covered in any sort of tarp or anything when it's being transported? No. Okay. And then uh, your involvement with this this dirt, is it simply what you're telling us is you photograph the dirt on the undercarriage and then collected it and put it into a bag or somebody else had collected it and put it into a bag? Yes, it was collected by CST Vance and I was personally there through the entire process. And then you took those photographs we just looked at, right? Yes. Uh, you didn't have any involvement with testing or comparing that dirt, did you? No. Okay. And then I think you testified that you took some pictures of this gasoline that we just looked at, right? I did not take the photographs. CST Vance did. But you were there? Yes. Okay. And you watched him take these photographs? Yes. And then you personally observed the amount of gas that was in those two uh, containers we just saw, right? Yes. Okay, and again, that was on July 20th of 2020? Yes. Sometime in the afternoon? I believe so, yes. Okay. And I don't mean to trick you, but the last time, from what you're aware, is that car was driven uh, on July 10th of 2020, right? Yes. I mean, if everything... If this car is just being transported by flatbed, it's not being driven, right? Correct. Are you aware whether anybody turned the ignition on of that Impala between July 10th of 2020 and July 20th of 2020, after the car was seized? To my knowledge, no, but I was also not there when others processed the interior of the car, so I cannot speak to their actions. Uh, yeah. To your knowledge, as of right now, there's been no more gasoline put in that Impala, right? Correct. Okay. And then, since this car had not been driven, from your knowledge, from July 10th of 2020, uh, are you aware, uh, or rather, you're, you're not aware when the last time that car was fueled, are you? No. Okay. You couldn't tell me then since you can't tell me when the last time that car was fueled, you couldn't tell me how much fuel was put in at the last time it was fueled? No. Okay, and you couldn't tell me a date when the last time it was fueled at all, could you? No. And lastly, I think you said you went to Danita Gardner's home, uh, and that's when you collected the clothes of Reja Terrell's? Yes. Okay, but that was prior to July 20th of 2020, right? Correct, that was Some, on July 10th. Okay, and that would have been after you talked with Aisha Lankford, right? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, simply all you did was gather those clothes uh, and what I'm getting at here is you didn't take you didn't take those clothes and, and test them for DNA, did you? No. Okay. Other than just transporting the clothes to, uh, I think it was a special agent you gave it to, who was that? Crime Scene Tech Stobal. You haven't seen those clothes since, have you? No. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. O'Donnell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective Garner 
on July 20th of 2020, when the vehicle, the Impala, was being um, towed to the public works building, do you recall what the weather conditions were like that day? I believe it was sunny and dry. There was no rain. Do you recall if it was particularly windy or anything like that? I believe I put the weather notes in my report. If I was to refer to that, I could tell you for sure. Would referring to your report refresh your memory? Yes. May he refer to his report? He may. I did not make a note of the wind in my report, but it was as sunny skies and 82 degrees was the high that day. Now, you were asked about the photographs taken of Aisha Langford's phone. Um, from looking at that call log, you testified you're unable to determine whether anything had been deleted there? Correct. Um, however, to your knowledge, did Aisha Langford then consent to having a full download done of her phone? Yes. And typically would a full Cellbrite download potentially show whether call logs had been deleted? Yes. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Waters. That's all I had, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Your Honor, the state calls FBI agent Richard Fenner to the stand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Please state your name for the record and spell both your first and your last name. Uh, Richard Fenner, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, last name F as in Frank, E-N-N-E-R-N. What is your occupation? I'm a special agent with the FBI. How long have you been employed with the FBI? Uh, 14 years. Describe your prior educational background. Uh, I have a um, criminal justice degree, associate's degree from the United States Air Force, and a bachelor's degree in accounting from Metropolitan State University in Minnesota. When did you complete your um, formal education? Uh, 2006. And then what did your career path look like before you joined the FBI? Immediately prior to the FBI, I worked at a CPA firm and obtained my CPA license. Prior to that, I was an activated guardsman with the Minnesota Air National Guard. Okay. How is it that you became employed with the FBI? Uh, I applied after obtaining my CPA license and was subsequently hired in 2009. Okay. Now, do you serve the FBI in some type of specialized capacity? Yes, I'm a member of the FBI's Cellular Analysis Survey Team, referred to as CAST. Where are you stationed out of? Currently, I'm out of Mexico City. Okay. Define what you mean when you say that you're a part of the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. Uh, the Cellular Analysis Survey Team, or CAST, is a group of FBI agents and task force officers that receive extensive training in cell phone technology and cell phone record analysis. Okay. And what is it that you do with these cell phone records? We assist in, in state, local, federal, and international investigations focusing on the records that are generated by the use of a phone to assist the investigation. Okay. In what ways can cellular phone records assist in criminal investigations? Uh, in criminal investigations, one type would be a fugitive. Uh, we would review cell phone records to locate an area of interest to search for those people and find them. Also, in a historical capacity, you'll have an event that'll occur, a robbery, a homicide, and we'll obtain records from people that are identified as suspects. We'll review, the, re review those records and include or exclude uh, people in investigations. Okay. So describe the process of an historical cellular record analysis. How does that work? Well, in a historical capacity, we usually get contacted by someone that says they have an event that occurred. Um, we advise to get obtain, obtain cell phone records from the cell phone company, which usually involves the process of getting a search warrant. We get those records back. We match those with cell tower lists from the phone companies and basically take Excel spreadsheets 
put them in a mapping software and create visual depictions of what those uh, records represent. Okay. Describe the type of training that you've received in order to conduct, conduct historical cell site analysis. Uh, my, uh, my training began in, I'd say, 2011 with a uh, course from the FBI. It's a two- or three-day course. From that, uh, I obtained an interest in that and went through the certification process for CAST, which I completed in 2013. That training is about 300 hours of training with the engineers from the cell phone companies. So we bring Verizon engineers, T-Mobile, AT&T, at that time I think Sprint and Cricket. So we learn how each company uh, creates their networks, what records are created when a phone is used in their networks, and then what we can do with those records. And then do you have continual training that you participate in to, to keep up with any changes in technology? Yes, at least yearly we have another uh, week of training where we bring in, again, the engineers and other companies that deal with location information for cell phones and uh, obtain additional knowledge about any updates that are occurring. Are you yourself involved in training other law enforcement officers in how to conduct historical cellular site analysis? Yes, I've provided training throughout uh, the U.S. as well as overseas, and I was also I'm in charge of the FBI's CAS training program for approximately five years. Okay. Help us understand the breadth of your experience. How often do you analyze call detail records? Uh, essentially daily for the last decade. Okay. And when we talk about um, call detail records, what specifically um, uh, does that mean? Well, there's various forms of it. The most basic level is when a, when a phone is being used, so you make or receive a call, there's records that are being created. So think of your cell phone bill. You'd see the numbers you're calling, the numbers that are calling you, how long that lasted. You'll see that on your bill. But additionally, when we get a warrant, we're able to see the cell tower identifiers for those records. So on the basic level, that gives us a tower in sectors that's used. Okay. Additionally, there's records that are created when you use a cell phone that are kind of referred to as engineering data, which allows us to have even more detailed information about that phone. Essentially, it can tell us how far the phone is actually located uh, from the cell tower. Now, when an individual is utilizing a cell phone, explain the relationship between the cell phone and a cell phone tower. Well, for a cell phone to operate, it needs to connect to the cell tower. So cell towers are strategically placed throughout our environment from the cell phone companies to provide seamless coverage. So in order for your phone to work to make a call, it's scanning, looking for the cell tower from its company, and it's looking for that strongest, clearest signal from that tower, and that's going to be the one that it connects to to make a call. If you could, give us a perspective of cell tower locations within the um, context of a metropolitan area. Uh, essentially, it comes down to where, where there's more people located, there are more cell towers. So in a dense populated environment, you can have cell towers that are blocks apart, so they have a smaller footprint. So there's a smaller area a phone would be versus you can go to a rural area and you can see cell phones that are much farther apart, five plus miles. In a metropolitan area where you have cell towers that are in close proximity to one another then, um, if a cellular device is being used, um, can it then feed off more than one tower? Yes, essentially a, a phone is designed to see more than one tower at a time. Okay, and how would that work then? Well, as your phone is on, it's constantly scanning and communicating with the network. And in that environment, it's not necessarily the strongest, clear signal. It's just essentially a, a feeling of where the phone is. It's then once you make that call, that's that strongest, clear signal that it's going to connect to. But there's other towers that are also seeing that phone at the same time. Okay. Have you had a chance to validate the location of a phone after an event has occurred? Yes. Explain how that would work. Well, in multiple capacities. Uh, one, I've worked a lot of missing persons cases. So we would obtain records from a missing individual. The last, say, the last time the phone was used was yesterday, so it's historical. We'll go and look in that area and find the individual, um, unfortunately, you know, many times deceased in those scenarios. Okay. Also, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Also, in a in like case like this, we utilize those historical records to go to areas to search for surveillance video or other evidence that can, can show where an individual was. So we do that to put together a timeline in criminal investigations. Okay. Are timelines really critical in um, criminal investigations, for example, in a situation where there has been a child reported to be missing? Absolutely critical, okay. yes. And why is it important to establish a timeline? 
because it allows you to focus your investigation where you need to. So it's always about what you know in search of what you don't know. So it's so important to find out what you know before you can find out what you don't know. Absolutely. Now, then, let's just go back to an earlier statement that you had made. Um, if you are able to locate um, a cell phone as having pinged off a particular cell tower then, um, does that identify an area where law enforcement would want to um, focus their efforts? Yes. Okay. And then once that location has been identified for law enforcement to focus their efforts, um, is that where they then go through the process of looking for any type of video surveillance um, footage that may help to um, develop a timeline and establish what was going on during that period of time? Yes. All right. Now, did you participate in the investigation being conducted by the Davenport Police Department involving a report of Briasia Terrell who had been reported missing on July 10th of 2020? Yes. Um, how did you initially become involved in that investigation? Initially, I believe beginning on July 10th, there was uh, FBI agents were in contact with Davenport Police and uh, questions started to develop over some cell phone records that they obtained uh, for Mr. Henry Dinkins. And they subsequently called me for questions, and that kind of slowly began my involvement before I physically uh, came to Davenport. Okay. At the time that you became involved in the um, investigation, were you aware that Henry Dinkins had been identified as the last known individual to be present with Briasia before she was reported missing? Yes. All right. By virtue of that, then, um, did that make him a subject of interest? Yes, always the last person that's with somebody is where you're going to start with, especially with the record analysis, and you're going to continue to work your way out from that. Okay. Being a subject of interest, then, did his um, cell phone then also become um, an item of evidence that was of interest? The physical device? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, did you have any involvement um, in doing a cellular record analysis of Henry Dinkins' cell phone? Yes, of the records associated with that cell phone. All right. Now, <clears throat> during the initial stage of the investigation, is that what you were primarily tasked with? Yes. Okay. At some point in time, did your um, duties um, in this investigation evolve? Yes. And how did your um, duties with this investigation evolve? Well, as once I became, came to Davenport and came to the command post, started focusing my efforts on the kind of the assisting with the overall investigation of putting the timeline together, uh, analyzing additional records of other people that we came into focus of the investigation. Okay. With respect to those additional responsibilities, um, had there been a search warrant issued for the cell phone of Henry Dinkins? Uh, uh, for the... The cell phone records, yes. The, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, the cell phone records of Henry Dinkins. Um, and then did you have the ability to conduct a review of those cell phone records? Yes. Who was the service provider for his phone? Verizon. Okay. And so would the search warrant have gone to Verizon? Yes, it would. Okay. When those records then were supplied by Verizon, what types of information was contained within those records? The normal historical records we see of the the, the uh, calls and text messages that were completed, as well as the engineering data that had some distance from Tower Association and some data records. Okay. And that engineering data, would it give us an idea of where that cell phone was located at during um, times um, of interest? Yes. All right. All right. Now, did you go through and look at um, the call logs to see um, uh, um, what type of activity there was relative to incoming calls and outgoing calls. Yes, that was part of the analysis. Okay. Um, would that have included incoming and outgoing calls um, during the time frame of July 9th and July 10th of 2020? Yes. Okay. Um, and then speaking um, in relation to that, were you aware then at 12 o'clock um, p.m. on June 10th, he would have presented himself to the Davenport Police Department. Yes. Okay. That being said, um, if there was any contact with any individuals prior to that time frame where there could be some type of contact through incoming calls or outgoing calls, um, was that something that you looked at? Yes. Did that form the basis then for other individual cell phones, um, and I should say the cell phone records of other individuals who had had contact with him? Yes. Okay. Beyond that then, um, uh, 
were there um, uh, text messages that was a part of the um, documentation provided by Verizon? Yes. Okay. And was that something that you would have reviewed as well? I've, I've seen them. I don't review those as much as those uh, don't actually for Verizon have cell tower locations with them. So I've focused more on the, the call side of it, but that was part of the overall uh, records we obtained. Okay. Now speak to this issue. Um, uh, when you had identified various numbers that he had had contact with, either through incoming calls or outgoing calls. Um, what was it that you were interested in determining about um, those individuals' cell phones? Well, at that case, you, you obviously want to interview those individuals to see what they say, and we obtained cell phone records then essentially to cor corroborate interviews. So it allows us to um, kind of fact check where people say they were at various times, we can look at those records and see if it's consistent or not. Okay. Was Aisha Langford an individual that was interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. Was Andrea Culberson an individual that had been interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. And I think it's clear, but for purposes of our record, what relationship did Aisha Langford have to Briasia Terrell? She is her mother. What relationship did Andrea Culberson have um, to any of the involved um, parties? She was the uh, was or is the significant other of Mr. Dinkins and was also, uh, I believe, rented the apartment where uh, this began. All right. Um, and then outside those two individuals, um, was law enforcement interested um, in associates or family members of Dinkins um, that they would want to be able to interview um, and look at their um, cellular records to identify um, where their cell phone had been during times that were of interest. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's pre been previously marked as State's Exhibit 144. Yes. How do you recognize States Exhibit 144? These are the names and some of the records that I analyzed in this case. Okay. Um, how is this document captioned? It's captions parties of interest and associated telephone numbers. And then does it give us a listing of the names um, for individuals that you would have analyzed their cell phone records? Yes. And does it also give the numbers associated, the telephone numbers, I should say, associated with the cellular devices of each of those individuals? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to introduce State's Exhibit 144. Okay. Exhibit 144 will be admitted. Your Honor, may I publish that? You may. Special Agent Fenneran, for purposes of our written record, let's go through and let's identify what we have. And let me just get that document set up correctly there. And I'm going to grab my glasses. All right. As for parties of interest and associated telephone numbers, um, uh, how many people do we have on this list? We have seven. Who's the first one? The first is Henry Dinkins. What is the telephone number that um, um, is associated with the cellular device that you would have done an analysis of? 563-726-4078. Uh, Who's the second individual? Aisha Langford. What is her associated telephone number? 563-676-4247. Who is our third subject? Andrea Culberson. What is her associated telephone number? 563 639 8716. Who is the fourth individual on that list? Uh, Nita McQuay. Um, what involvement or relationship does Nita McQuay share with any of the involved individuals? It's my understanding she is Mr. Dinkins' sister. What is her telephone number? 563 484 6834. Who is the first, uh, fifth individual on that list? Helen Mosley. What relationship does she have to any of the parties? Um, Mr. Dinkins' mother. What is the telephone number that was associated with her? 563-459-7791. Who is the sixth individual on that list? Uh, Fornell Lang. What is the associated telephone number for Mr. Lang? An associate of Mr. Dink. Oh, sorry. Okay. 563-200-3015.
And what relationship does Fornell Lang have to any of the parties? An associate of Mr. Dinkins. And finally, who is the seventh individual that was listed on this exhibit? Uh, Genesis Johnson. With the telephone number of? 312-597-5484. With that being said, explain to us why um, there would be an interest in Nita McQuay or Helen Mosley. Uh, based on telephone calls that happened during the time of interest. Okay. Why was there an interest in Fornell Lang? Uh, again, uh, communication with Mr. Dinkins as well as the res result of interviews. Okay. And then uh, why was there an interest in Genesis Johnson? Uh, same reason, uh, calls and results of interviews. All right. Now, did you generate a report of your cellular analysis of Mr. Dinkins' cell phone? Yes, I did. Your Honor, may the record reflect... May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 62 for purposes of identification. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 62? I do. How do you recognize State's Exhibit 62? This is the final cellular analysis report I created for this case. Okay. Um, whose cell phone um, is this report um, attached to? Uh, Mr. Dinkins. And is that telephone number listed on State's Exhibit Number 62? Yes, it is. And if you could read that into the record and identify <laughs> the um, service provider for that. Yes, it's 563-726-4078, and it's a Verizon phone. And what date was this um, uh, um, a final... Well, I guess, well, let, okay, let me go ahead and move on. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to introduce state's exhibit number 62. Okay. Exhibit 62 will be admitted. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, may the state introduce state's exhibit number 62 into the record, or publish it, I should say. You may. All right. All right, Special Agent Fenneran, if you could... Um, Walk us through this exhibit and explain to us then um, uh, what you were able to determine by virtue of your analysis of Mr. Dinkins' cell phone records. First of all, what were the dates that we were looking at? Uh, July 9th and July 10th, 2020. Why were we interested in July 9th? That is when Breja first came in contact with Mr. Dinkins. Okay. And then July 10th, just to state the obvious, why was law enforcement interested in the date of July 10th? That's when we no longer uh, knew where Briasia was. Okay. All right. What do we have here as uh, an opener? This is just a cover sheet. It obviously lists my name and the FBI Cellular Analysis Survey Team. We have, I was assigned to the FBI Criminal Investigative Division at the time. The case number is listed as uh, 7COM3290265 which is our FBI case number associated with this. Subsequently, we have the number of Mr. Dinkins, 563-726-4078, and May 12, 2022, which is when this final draft was created. Certainly. Now, um, your 
FBI number, is that distinctly different than from what the Davenport Police Department would assign to their reports as an investigative number? Yes. Okay. Does each agency have their own investigative number? Yes. All right. Explain to us what we have on page exhibit or page two of um, this exhibit. In general, this is just an overview that we provide with the report. It says we were requested, or I was requested by the Davenport Police to analyze the cell phone records for the target number in relation to Briasia Terrell um, missing on J July 10th, 2020. Methodology talks about we obtained the cell phone records from the cell phone company. We matched those with the cell tower uh, locations provided by the company at the time the event happened. And we merge those together to provide the visual depictions that we'll see in subsequent pages. Page three of your report. Page three is just showing an overview kind of of cell tower examples. So uh, the point of this is to understand that cell towers are, are all around us. So we may not identify them clearly as cell towers but they, they are. In this case, the, the top left of the screen might be what we traditionally think of a cell tower, a large pole with the antennas on it. Uh, that is what most of the cell towers in this case uh, look like. They're much of the larger towers. Page four. Page four is now getting into understanding how cell, cell towers operate and how they look. So this, if you see the top left, Cartoon illustration is showing kind of that traditional cell tower. Now the circle, if you look down, you see a triangle. That's like if you look down onto a cell tower. So essentially that tower location is divided into three different sectors, each of them being approximately 120 degrees. So 360 degrees in a circle, cut it in thirds, and we have a 120 degree sector. So a way to think of this is if I was standing on the cell tower with a, a, a um, spotlight. I'm going to spotlight that in the sector one at zero degrees. So that's where my spotlight's focused. That's going to be where the antenna's focused for the cell phone signal. It's going to fan out left and right to provide approximately 120 degree of coverage, just like a light would do. Okay. And then when a cell phone is hitting off of a particular cell tower, um, it, does the location of that cell phone dictate where it's going to fall in either sector one, sector two, and sector three? Yes, that's going to be captured in the, the records. Okay. Will that be illustrated as we go through this particular exhibit? Yes. Page five. Explain to us what is on page five. Page five is now just taking this a little step further, removing kind of the other illustrations. So this is showing you those same left and right uh, limits in the right arms. Those are approximate. And then you see a shaded area in that. That's just depicting the general, the area of the coverage. Um, each tower has its own coverage, so we would need to look at the other towers in that area to see how far the coverage would be. Say, for example, a cell phone is hitting off of this tower, and it's in sector one. Um, any type of um, indication of that, if you were to apply it to an aerial map, um, will it show these arms that we're seeing going off to the left or the right as the coverage um, area for that sector? You mean in, in the depictions that I have? Yes. Yes, you'll see that. Okay. Going to page number six. What do we have in page number six? This would be kind of describing what, what you just referred to. This is how you'll actually see it when we look on a map. You'll have the left and right arms, and then you'll see the coverage is going in the direction of that shaded area. Okay. And like, for example, here, um, if we were to think of sector two and sector three as being below, um, what would be the point of that V? Um, the um, portion that's that arced circle, would that um, <coughs> illustrate the area where the cell phone was sitting off? Yes. Going to page seven, what do we have in page seven? Page seven is now getting into the engineering data I referred to. This is commonly referred to as timing advance through all the companies, although each company has their own name for it. With Verizon, it's referred to as the real-time tool or RTT. But essentially, this is the information that happens in the background where the cell tower is communicating with the phone and measuring how long it takes the signal to go from the tower to the phone and back. And from that, as you see in this illustration, we'll get, a, we'll get a distance in the records. This dotted line represents the distance of what we get back from the phone company. And then you'll see a shaded area on each side of that 
which represents then, based on that distance, how, where we'd expect to find the phone. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention to the blue uh, um, arrow that's shooting toward the top of the page, and then the blue arrow that's shooting back toward what I'm going to call the center of the cell tower. Um, take that back to what you've described in terms of being able to determine distance of that cell phone from that tower. So those blue arrows are essentially illustrating the signal going out and the signal coming back. So from that, there's going to be a time that, that you get with the records. Now, we know a rate for that signal. So when we know the rate and we know how long it took, we can combine those to calculate the distance of where the phone would be located. Going to page 8. Explain um, page 8 and what you've got documented here. Just a further illustration now of, you see the cell tower and sector, so if we didn't have the timing advance, we'd expect the phone somewhere to be from there to the next tower to the north. But when we have timing advance, you're going to see the arc on the screen, as you do here, which means where that arc is, is going to be where that phone's going to be located. Okay. So from that arc, moving toward the, um, what I'm going to call the center of the cell tower, is it within that region? The, it's going to be within the shaded area of the actual arc. If I can... Yeah, absolutely. And, can, yeah, you've got, you know what, I, I, oh, no, it's not showing up here, but we do have um, uh, one of these pointers, pointers that you can help us understand. So, essentially, when we're looking at this illustration, the phone's going to be in this shaded area up here. Gotcha. Page 9. Page 9 is now getting into the analysis for this case. All right. What date do we have set forth? This is showing uh, July 9th, 2020. Okay. And what is the time frame that we're talking about? 12.56 a.m. to 10, uh, to 11.05 a.m. All right. If we take the time frame of 11.05 a.m., what does that correlate with relative um, uh, to the investigation and Henry Dinkins and his initial contact with the children? This is my understanding sometime between 11 uh, a.m. and noon was the time that uh, Brasia and her brother became um, in Mr. Dinkins' custody. Okay. Now, up to the top portion of that, um, um, I'm going to call um, picture, um, there appears to be a legend. Can you explain that legend to us? Yes. On the top left, you see a, a red circle, and then it says Verizon Cell Towers. You're going to see that on every, every page that we have on here. That's going to re represent where Verizon Cell Towers are located. So anytime you see a red dot on any of these particular pages of this exhibit, that would represent a cell phone tower? Correct. Okay. And then the next entry on that legend, what is that? That's now you're going to see a red tag. That's identifying the address of 2744 East 53rd Street, which is the residence of uh, Mr. Dinkins and Andrea Culberson. Okay. So between midnight going into the morning of July 9th to 1105, <laughs> generally where is that cell phone located at? So what this is showing is the phone would be consistent with being at that residence. Okay. And what that means, essentially, the phone could be located anywhere along that arc that we see. We see the two distances during this time frame. So it could be anywhere along that when you take it by itself. Okay. Again, when you apply it with knowing a known address, that information is consistent with the phone being located there. Can you show us then, too, on page 9, where 2744 East 53rd would be um, represented? It is uh, represented down here at the bottom right of the page with the red icon. Now, as we go through this next series of pages, um, I note that there is a box. It's got um, the coloring of red at the top, and then below it, white, and then there are several entries. Can you help us understand the nature of those entries? Yes, here where it says ENB, it's representative of E node B, which is just another way to say the cell tower. So that's the identifier for the cell tower and sector. And then you're going to have the date listed in there, and then the time of specific events. Or in this case, it's showing just a series of events from a block of time. So it just says 12.56 a.m. to 11.05.22 uh, a.m. with the distances 126, 1.26 miles to 1.31 miles. Okay. And since you've just got that range of times there, does that suggest that that cell phone is hitting off that tower within that entire window of time? A it means there's various times within there that it's hitting. I don't have the exact one spelled out, but it means there's no other activity showing the phone anywhere else. Okay. Bobby, did you need to take that? I was too late. At this time, we'll take our mid-afternoon break. Uh, we will reconvene at um, 310.
Thank you.
proceed. Thank you. Explain the data that is on page 10. Yes, we're now looking uh, the next activity on July 9th um, by Mr. Dinkins' phone showing 11.32 a.m. to 11.34 a.m. All right. Now, between the time frames of 11.32 a.m. and 11.34 a.m., does it show um, some type of movement of his cell phone? Yes, it does. If we go up to our legend then, um, is there an entry in the legend that we want to be interested in? Yes, in the uh, green color tag, we have the address of 509 Taylor Street. Was 509 Taylor Street um, an address that was subject to the investigation conducted by the Davenport Police Department? It ended up being yes. Okay. Um, and then um, what was that address associated with? I believe it was an associate of Mr. Dinkins where he spent uh, some of the day on July 9th. Okay. And then would that um, be in accord with information that Mr. Dinkins provided in his interview um, and the child DL who talked about um, the activities between he, his father, and Briasia on July 9th? I believe so, yes. Okay. So then if we look at that bottom box, at um, uh, the lower portion of the diagram, what essentially is that telling us there? So at, at the bottom we have again the cell tower identifier and the date and time. So what we're seeing on here is from 11.32 to 11.34 we see movement from the top right of the screen to the middle of the screen as I have an arrow depicting that movement. Okay, and then um, if we go to that top box then essentially what is it telling us? That's showing the earlier activity, 11.32, 11.34, the distances uh, that are being hit in progression as it moves. And if we focus on 509 Taylor Street then, is Mr. Dinkins' cell phone consistently hitting off the same tower? Uh, as 509, it would not be at 509 yet until the next activity we see on the next slide. Okay, all right, but it's coming within that area, would that be fair to it, say? It's moving towards that area, yes. All right, let's go to page 10 of our exhibit. What are we seeing in page 10 of our exhibit? Now we're seeing those uh, two cell towers that are activated between 11.34 a.m. and 2.04 p.m. And you see the various distances from those two towers. You'll notice there's two areas that correlate to overlap between those two. I'm going to point one is going to be right here by 509 Taylor Street. And then we have another area to the left that also overlaps. Okay. Does that give us an indication of the cellular device being fairly stationary or being stationary there at 509 Taylor Street? It is consistent with that, yes. Okay. Um, and then you had talked earlier when we had discussions about um, um, metropolitan areas with a larger concentration of cell phone towers. Is this an example of where a cell phone would hit on towers within an area that are fairly close to one another? Yes, it would be. Okay. Now let's go to page number 12 of the exhibit. What are we seeing in page 12? Page 12 is now taking from that 204 time period where we ended the last slide to now 216 p.m. on July 9th, showing now the activity begins at the bottom middle of the screen near the uh, address of 509 Taylor Street. And then we see if this was in motion, we'd see activity going from that bottom left to the top right going to the area of 2744 East 53rd Street. Okay, so to be clear then, is there movement then, a transition from the location of that cellular device heading toward 2744 East 53rd Street? Yes. And then what is the time frame associated with that again? That's 204 to 216 p.m. Going to page 13, what do we um, have happening here? This is now act after that activity at 241 p.m., the only activations that we see on this phone from July, uh, July 9th at 2.41 until 5.54 a.m. on July 10th are the same cell tower and sector we saw the first slide and the same distances again that would be consistent with the address of 2744 East 53rd Street. Okay. And is 2744 East 53rd Street in our legend? Yes, it is in the uh -huh. red. Okay, I'm sorry, excuse me. So then, if we look at 2.41 p.m. on July 9th to 5.54 a.m. on July 10th, does that give us any indication that that cell phone was within that region that entire time? Not the, we don't know for sure for the entire time. There's only little activations that happen at this time. So okay. there's activations at 10.45 uh, p.m. 
and then, then next activation with data is not until 3.32 a.m. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But then what we do, what I do see during this, if I'm looking at the overall records, there are two calls that take place at 3.11 and 3.12 a.m. Those are incoming calls that come to the phone that do not register a cell tower, which would be consistent with the phone being powered off or on Wi-Fi only. In other words, not connected to the cellular network. Okay. You had an opportunity to look at Andrea Culberson's um, cellular phone data. Correct. Okay. Were you aware that Andrea Culberson worked for AT&T? Yes. Um, and were you aware that Andrea Culberson actually worked from home and had a desk with equipment associated with her responsibilities for AT&T at the home? Yes. Okay. If Andrea Culberson were to testify that she woke up at 3 o'clock and had tried to call Mr. Dinkins and found his phone there at the apartment, would that be consistent with her um, statement to law enforcement. Uh, with her statement and her cell phone records, that would be consistent, yes. Okay, all right, and then go ahead and explain the other entries that we're seeing at 3.37 a.m. and then at 5.54 a.m. Yes, so then there's only activity that short period, 3.32 to 3.37. There's a kind of a burst of activity, be consistent with the phone essentially being powered on. And then again, there's no activity again until 5.54 a.m. So. Between that, there's no calls that take place between that time frame, so I can't say for sure that the phone would be powered off or not. It's just it's not communicating with the network. Okay, all right. If a cell phone um, is plugged in um, and being charged, take that scenario and apply it to these variables. Uh, it, it can be, if it's plugged in and being charged, if it's not on, it's not going to register with the network. So just being plugged in is not going to register with the network. It has to be turned on. Gotcha. Going to page 14, what are we seeing on page 14? Now 14, we kind of see an overview of some activity that happens for a short period of time from 5.54 a.m. to 6 a.m. What you're going to see is you, you see numbers listed here. It has one at the bottom right and an arrow going to the left where it has number two. And it has an arrow going towards the top, number three, again to the right, number four, and then back down to number five. What that shows is during this time period, we see activity where the phone hits dis towers and distances here, moving to the left, moving north, back to the east, and then back south. So by the, how those, each of those arcs interact, you can tell that there's movement that happens with the phone. Okay. Show us on page 14 of this diagram where 2744 East 53rd Street is located. It's going to be right here where the number one is as well right by the number five. All right. Um, were you aware of law enforcement having done a canvas looking for locations where there were video cameras that would pick up the movement of that maroon Chevy Impala? Yes, during the time of creating this, this, is, this was the point of, of what I was putting together as we were using it in the investigation to focus efforts to pull video. Okay, all right. So were you aware that there was video feed collected from Quickstar on 53rd? Yes. Were you um, uh, aware that there was video feed collected on Eastern going north um, uh, from a residence at Judson Court? Yes. Okay. So one to two, would that um, go past Quickstar? Yes, it would. Two to three, would that go down Eastern heading north past Judson Court? Yes, it would. And then were you aware that there was video collected at Woodland Avenue um, coming back south toward the apartment? Yes. Um, would that correlate with point four? Number four to number one. Four to five, yep, yes. Okay, and then um, between three and four, is that the area of Veterans Memorial Parkway? I believe so, yes. All right, so this path of travel, what is the time frame associated with this path of travel? This is 5.54 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so with that being said, um, are we going to want to pay attention to video feed that comes in later on that explains this activity. Yes, and also the, the phone number, we see that, so 554 is when the travel begins. There's then an, a call, that an incoming call to this phone at 5.55 a.m. from Andrea Culberson's phone. Okay. Um, did you have information about Henry Dinkins having left 20, um, 744 East 53rd Street around um, a little before 5.54 a.m. with Notorious? Yes, okay. yes. 
Um, and did you have any information about Andrea Culberson calling him, which brought him back to the apartment? Yes. And what was the purpose for that call? Uh, the purpose was to come back to get something. I don't recall exactly what that was. Okay. All right. So would this be consistent if that testimony is offered? Yes. Okay. Going to page number 15, what do we see here? This is now the next activity between 6 a.m. and 6.04 a.m., utilizing the one tower and, and distance we normally see associated with the uh, residents of 2744 East 53rd Street, and then another tower just to the south of that that has distances, again, in that same neighborhood of, the, uh, of 53rd Street. Can you point out those two towers? Yes, we have the normal tower that we see with the larger distance at the residence, and then the next tower here at the bottom right. We're hitting off two different sectors at, at basically the same distances. Okay, so is that cell phone hitting off the two towers um, basically at the same time? Essentially, yes. All right, and then um, uh, from what you note here, what else can we deduce from this? So what we know based on a four-minute period and, and these hits happening, that our, the phone is going to be located in that immediate vicinity of the apartment complex. Okay. Now, is there a call that um, is documented um, uh, between Henry Deacon's phone and another cell phone? Yes. Um, what is that cell phone number? That's again 563-639-8716. Whose telephone number is that? That's Andrea Culberson's. And what time is that? Uh, 6.01 a.m. Going back to our earlier discussion, then does that activity correlate um, with calls relative to him coming back and picking up some item? Yes. All right. Going to states or page um, 16. What are we seeing on page 16? This is now the next activity. At the bottom right, you see that last 6.04 a.m. activity with an arc just south of the address location. And then we have 6.05, another distance just to the west of the apartment, which again would show that the phone has, is now moving. Okay. Is the phone, is the phone, is the phone moving westward? Uh, west, west and uh, north. West and north. Okay. Um, I want to take you to States Exhibit number 38. So in looking at States Exhibit number 38, um, if um, you would, on this particular diagram, um, does um, it give us um, um, areas that would correlate with this movement? For example, 53rd Street? Yes, I believe we're, are we, we're looking at this bottom, bottom right area that we see here. Okay, and then um, do you see Highway 61? Yes, in the larger overall view, yes. Yes, okay. And then so Highway 61 movement north um, does Highway 61 actually run north? Yes. All right. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about relative to this, does that cell phone um, stay powered on so we can track its movement? I, there is no activity after this 6.05 a.m. until 7.02 a.m., which we'll see is a completely different area. All right. As we've seen for the previous, when this phone has been moving, we are seeing activity in the record showing that movement. So that would be consistent with the phone then being powered off at approximately 6.05 a.m. Okay. So if it's powered off between 6.05 a.m. and 7.02 a.m., without the benefit of video surveillance, would we have any idea um, where that phone had traveled to? Uh, with a, no. All right. Going to... Page 17, explain what we've got on page 17. Page 17 is now uh, the reason I originally became involved with this case, and, and that's this uh, data activity that occurs at 7.02 a.m. What happened at 7.02 a.m.? We had a burst of essentially activity for a very short period of time showing the phone on the network, okay. and that was a considerable amount of distance away from the previous activity which um, we saw in Davenport, we're now in the area near Comanche. And this activity became significant because this was the only time this phone had ever essentially traveled, um, ever had traveled into that area or even to the nearby area to the left of there. Okay, I want to come back and revisit that topic of discussion. But for the time being, let's go to our legend. What entries do you have in the legend? What we have first, obviously, the, the red circles, again, being the Verizon Tower locations. You see more of them in the area. Well, I, yeah. Excuse me. 
more of them, again, you see more populated area of Davenport. There's more towers. We then have, again, in the red down here is 2744 53rd Street, which is the area of the previous cell tower hit. We then have the blue, the Walmart, uh, which became important after we began investigating this cell tower hit. And then also on here, at the top here, we have the location of where Briasia eventually was recovered. Okay. Now, the Walmart, um, which community is it located in, Comanche or Clinton? In Clinton. Okay. The cell phone tower that that cell phone hit off, does it lie between Comanche and Clinton? Yes, it does. Okay. And then so when that phone, Henry Dinkins' phone, hit on that cell phone tower, um, directionally, where did it place that cell phone? Uh, to the north of the tower. Okay. So did that then provide information for canvassing conducted by law enforcement on July 10th and thereafter in the area of Highway 30 going into and out of Clinton? Yes. All right. And did that produce some valuable information? Yes, it did. What type of information did it produce? That allowed investigators to canvass for video, and they found video of Mr. Dinkins at a Walmart at the time of the cell tower hit. Okay. Now, when you were going through and you were doing the analysis of his cell phone records, um, recognizing that he's at this location on July 10th, did you go back through those cell phone records to see if this was an area that his cell phone um, would regularly be located um, in or about? Yes, I did. Okay, what did you find? This was the only time the phone had ever been anywhere near that area. And how far back did you look? Uh, six months. Going to page 18, tell me what we have on page 18. Page 18 is now looking at a closer up, uh, view of that cell tower and sector in relation to the Walmart and Clinton. Okay. And what time do we get that very limited hit off that cell tower? Uh, 7.02 a.m. Tell us um, what you mean by that. So it's coming on at 7.02 a.m. Then is the cell phone powered off after that, or what's going on? Uh, it's consistent with that. It's just we get a... Uh, I'd say a blip of data at 7.02 a.m., and then we don't get anything again until, I believe, 8.05 a.m. So it would be a consistent with a phone being turned off and then, turn, and then turned back off. What if the battery had been removed from the cell phone? Uh, we would have no data when that battery is removed. Going to page 19. So page 19 is now showing additional efforts that we did uh, when early on in this investigation, when this hit took place, I had a colleague um, who went out and did what was called a drive test. So we have survey gear that goes out and measures a cell phone signal. So what uh, that entails is that that agent went up and down every road they could in this area where the cell tower was to get a overview of where this tower could possibly have coverage. Not just the strongest, clearest for a phone connection, but total any possibility of where that phone could kick connect for that blip. So then we use that to send out uh, search, uh, search parties to search that area. As, as I said earlier, this, we know what we know, and this was the only known we had at the point of where to search for Briasia. I want to direct your attention to events of July 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. Was there a major search conducted up there in the Clinton area by virtue of this blip that had occurred at 7.02 a.m.? Yes. Okay. Now, going back to State's Exhibit number um, 38, I believe. Let me just pull that down. Yeah. Going back to State's Exhibit 38. On this particular map, can you show the jury, or not the jury, can you show us what area um, uh, that was encompassed within that search that was conducted? Uh, the areas I point with the pointer up to the top right of the board here of the exhibit, you see the cell tower, and then you can kind of see how it lines up with the presentation as far as the search areas that are broken out to cover the coverage area of that cell tower. Okay. Now, um, those areas that were searched, is that all encompassed within those pink blocks that look like they've been divided up into grids? Uh, the, the main focus of that tower is covered in there, yes. Okay. All right. Going to page number 20. What information can we glean from page 20? So now, uh, based after 7.02 a.m., we had no activity now until it's uh, 8.09 a.m. I believe I said 8.05 before. So at 8.09 a.m., the phone is now back on. 
However, it is now in the southwest of Davenport area. So now again, considered a, or traveled a considerable amount of time in an hour and, and seven minutes since the previous transaction. So between 702 and 809, do we have any information about the location of that fault? No, we do not. And what are the reasons why we would not be able to locate um, uh, um, or gather location information? What would have to happen? Well, there's a couple things. One is just simply no activity, which I, I would find unlikely based on the movement of the phone. The other would be the phone is, is powered off in some sort of state or in Wi-Fi only. We're going to circle the wagons again and go back to what you talked about when you were talking about engineering data. So even if there aren't telephone calls being made or received, um, as that phone is moving, are we still going to have um, that engineering information generated that would give us location information? That stuff is is happening in the background. It's not a guarantee, as you said, as I said, like that it would be necessarily re recorded. But as we see on the other activity of the phone, when the phone has been moving, we do see that activity. Okay. Let's go to our legend. And what entries do we have on our legend on page 20? We again have the red for the Verizon cell towers, and we now have a blue tag identifying a trailer or a motorhome that was located on Schmidt Road. Okay. What association does that motorhome have to Henry Dinkins? My understanding, it is uh, Mr. Dinkins' motorhome, and it was also a surveillance video associated with activity at that motorhome. Certainly. Was that the location of that motorhome um, near the island of Credit Island? Yes, just north of there, yes. Okay. All right. So now, tell us what happens then at 8.09 a.m. So now is the first time we're, we're getting a flurry of activity that takes place, and I have noted on here, this activity includes incoming and outgoing calls with 563-676-4247, which is the cell phone of Briage's mother, Aisha uh, Lankford, I believe. Okay. Give us, uh, have you documented then the times of um, any type of activity between Mr. Dinkins' phone and Aisha Lankford's phone? I have, I have notes uh, here that ha detail which calls are for which, but I do not have them on this presentation. Can you go ahead and give us that information? Yes. So beginning at uh, 8.09 and 8.10 a.m., there's two calls that are incoming from Aisha Lankford that are forwarded, meaning they, they hit a cell tower, so it rang, but they were not answered. After that, um, there's an outgoing at 8.11 from Mr. Dinkins back to Aisha Lankford, lasting 117 seconds. Then there at 8.15 a.m., there's an incoming call from Aisha Lankford uh, for 92 seconds. After that call ends, there's another. There's an incoming call now from Andrea Colberson that lasts 147 seconds. And then finally, there's another 819 call with Aisha Lankford that I believe only lasts for a second, so not really completed call. All right. Would it be fair to say then there was quite a bit of communication going um, back and forth or attempted um, by Aisha Lankford with that telephone number? or things that were coming in from Henry Dinkins? Yes. Okay. Now, would her cell phone records then speak to that? Yes. All right. Going to page 21. What do we have in page 21? 21 is now the next activity, which is 8.25 a.m. That is now just using another cell tower in that same area, but now across the river, um, pointing back to the south southwest towards Credit Island. That does, it, does that suggest that the phone had crossed over to the Illinois side of the river? No. Just simply hitting on a tower over there? Correct. Okay. Um, is there any type of calls coming in or going out during this period of time? At that time, this is an incoming call from uh, Aisha Lankford again for uh, 59 seconds. And what time was she calling in again? 8.25 a.m. All right. Where does that place Mr. Dinkins' cell phone? Uh, so I'll use this, that again, this tower is shooting back a across the river to where you have Credit Island right here, and then just to the edge of that to the north, you also have the uh, trailer location. Okay. Uh, were you aware of information reported um, that Mr. Dinkins had represented to Aisha Langford that during this period of time he was heading down to the Davenport Police Department? Objection, were you being called to do so? 
um, I don't think, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Well, to be clear, let me ask you this. Does his cell phone stay in this area? Uh, after this period, no. But up to this point in time, is his cell phone in this area? Yes, yes. The previous activity across the river near Schmidt Road and this all in the general southeast part of Davenport. Southwest part, sorry. Page 22, what are we seeing? Page 22 is now taking the next activity at 8.32 a.m. Uh, to 8.44 a.m. And what we start is the bottom left of the screen. I have arrows again to help with movement. They're not identifying specific roads, just the general movement of the phone. That goes to the north, then it goes to the, to the east. Okay. Is the cell phone traveling? It is. Okay. Now, so if it's heading north, is it going from our southern border down by the Mississippi and then starting to travel through Davenport heading north? Yes. And then as it's heading east, then would that start to take us um, more toward what would be our eastern border of Bettendorf? Yes. Okay. Is there something significant about this movement that correlates between contact um, that occurred between Henry Dinkins and Aisha Lankford? Yes. Explain. Uh, Sometime after this, I believe closer to the, the next time frame, 844-ish, uh, Mr. Dinkins and Aisha Langford meet up and exchange the brother of Breasia at a McDonald's located, I believe, Eastern and Kimberly. Okay. Is there any calls taking place during this time frame? Yes. Okay, what are, what's the nature of the call activity? Again, there's two outgoing calls uh, to the number ending in 8716, which is Andrea Culberson. And then there's, again, a flurry, five incoming and outgoing calls with the number ending in 4247, which is going to be Brasia's mother, Aisha Langford. All right. And then there's a third number that you have up there. Do we have any idea who that is? Yes. The number 563-888-3444 is a number that represents the Davenport Police Department. Communication specialist Mona Varelli had testified that she had contact with Aisha Langford at 8.29 a.m., and then subsequently thereafter, she had called Henry Dinkins from the Davenport Police Department. Does that correlate with the 563-888-3444 number? Yes, it does. And then what time does um, that call come in to Mr. Dinkins' phone? That call is the one that takes place at 8.38 a.m. 8.38 a.m. Last. Going to page 23, what does 23 tell us? 20, 23 is now picking up at the next activity, 8.44 a.m. to 8.48 a.m. We see the beginning of that activity is at the center of the page uh, where the McDonald's is located, uh, showing this phone then would be consistent with being at the McDonald's when this exchange occurs. How long is the phone there in that area? Uh, only a, a couple of minutes. Okay, from there then? From there, the last hit we see is the 8.48.56, uh, which is the right side of the screen and the arc uh, just to the east of the McDonald's, which would be show that by that time, 848, the phone is now moved from the McDonald's. Okay. Is there another incoming call that comes from the Davenport Police Department? Yes, there is. What time is that? That's at 844 uh, 8 a.m. All right. Going to, states, or going to page 24. I've got to quit saying states exhibit. Page 24, what do we have happening here? Now we can have a variety of movement that happens after the, the previous... Uh, transactions. We have the McDonald's here in the middle right of the screen, bottom middle right. And our first activity is at 8, 8, uh, 48, 849 with this large arc from the right side of the screen facing back to the left. After that, our next hit is a call at 9.12.08 a.m., which is the center left of the screen facing back to the west. Next is 9.19 at the far left of the screen. And then after that, we have 9.31, a call back to the right of the screen, uh, close to the 2744 East 53rd Street. Okay. Who are those calls um, between? There is one incoming and one outgoing, with the number ending in 8716 for Andrea Culberson, and one incoming call from Aisha Lankford um, during this time. Just staying there, then... Um, with what we see, is Mr. Dinkins mobile during this period of time? Or I should say, is the cell phone mobile at this point in time? Yes, it, it is moving. Okay. Now, uh, another thing that I want to ask you about. Um, uh, when you were going through and analyzing the phone, um, uh, were there periods of time where it 
was shut down? There is sometimes, yes. Okay. Uh, explain that to us if you could. There's the only time where I can tell where a phone is actually uh, shut down. You obviously have the absence of data, but then when you have calls that are incoming calls that are coming that do not connect to a cell tower, that's going to indicate either the phone is off or in airplane mode what a, in a way that it is untrackable at that point. Okay. Um, can you tell us what those time frames were? Um, specifically, I think I have it in a, in a, a further slide. During this period here, I, I can't make that determination because there's not those missed calls. Okay, let's talk about page 25. Uh, page 25 is now the next activity from 9.35 a.m. to 9.44 a.m. Again, showing the overall movement of Mr. Dinkins' phone. Here we're going to st start at the top right of the screen where we have activity just to the east of the residence. Again, I have arrows showing the general movement of the phone to the south and then back to the west towards uh, a residence that's identified by 1321 East 39th Street in orange. Who resides at 1321 East 39th Street? My understanding is Mr. Dinkins' uh, sister, McQuay. Nita McQuay? Yes. All right. And did that address then become the subject of a search warrant? I believe so, yes. All right. <clears throat> Is that also one of the reasons why her cell phone was analyzed? Yes. All right. Page 26. Now picking up at activity 9.44 a.m. to 9.52 a.m., and this is kind of a zoomed-in version of in the middle right of the screen. We have the address uh, in orange again, and then we show all the different arcs that are taking place during this uh, eight-minute time frame. And I have it, you see, in darker red, meaning there's more activations in that area. So meaning this area that's in the red is an area of interest just to the, um, to the west and kind of southwest of the orange icon. Okay, let's talk about just the different arcs so that we understand why there are so many arcs that appear. Explain that to us. Uh, as Again, as the phone's on, it's c communicating with many different towers, and those are getting, at times, c captured by the network, and when they are, we, we're able to use them. So it, in here, it's just consistent with you're in the same place kind of during a lot of this, but there is some movement as well during this time frame. Okay. Going to page third, or 27. So this now is picking up the next activity and, and an answer to one of your earlier questions. Um, so this is showing 10.08, uh, activity at 10.08 a.m. And during this time frame, there's an outgoing call to um, Andrea uh, Culberson uh, for 167 seconds. After this time frame, there's no other tower activity until 11.10 a.m. During this time, this is one of those times where I can say that the phone is off. Uh, during this time, there's 22 incoming calls to uh, Mr. Dinkins' phone that do not hit cell towers and all go directly to voicemail. Page 28. We're now looking at 11.14 to 11.26 a.m., where we have, again, a series of calls. Um, I have icons here, so we have two different sectors from the same tower, labeled 1 and 2. So we begin at 11.14 with calls on the north, um, northeast sector of the tower identified. Again, 11.14, 11.15. All those calls are outgoing calls to um, Andrea Culberson. And then next we have 11.22 on sector 2. Uh, another outgoing, I'm sorry, that's an incoming call that is, ends up being forwarded. And then after that, 1124 and 1126 on the right-hand side of the screen facing back to the left, which is an outgoing call at 1124 and an incoming call from Aisha Langford at 1126. Okay. Um, now, we're seeing that phone hitting off different towers. What location of town is this activity occurring in? This is now kind of in the more downtown Davenport, a little slightly to the uh, west. And then can you show us the location of where the RV was located at? The RV would be located here at the middle bottom in the blue. Going to page 29. 29 is now the next activity from 11.29 a.m. to 11.46. Uh, during calls with 8716, Andrea Culberson, 
and two um, additional numbers listed on the screen, 563-484-6834 and 563-459-7791. This shows first activity at the bottom left of the screen, 1129-1131, and then moving to the right and to the north, um, going back where it settles uh, in the proximity of 1321 East 39th Street. All right, beyond Andrea Culberson's telephone number of the 86 or 8716, those other two numbers, are they um, numbers that belong to any of the individuals of, um, on our list? I don't recall at the, off the top of my head. I believe 7791 appears familiar to me, but I, I don't recall as I sit here. Okay, and then I'll hand you State's Exhibit 144 again. Yes, uh, the 563-484-6834 uh, is the phone for Anita McQuay. And I was in, uh, the 779 one, that one ending in 779 is Helen Mosley, so the sister and the mother of Mr. Dinkins. Okay, and then he's traveling up toward that area? Correct. All right, or I should say the cell phone is. And then finally, let me see, um, going to page 30. Page 30 is now the last activity we have for the cell phone as it comes to the police department. This is from 11.49 a.m. to 12.04 p.m. Uh, when Mr. Dinkins approximately arrives to the police department. Um, during this time, there's again activity with Andrea uh, Culberson, uh, the, his mother, and additional number of 8365. Okay, and then do we know who that additional number of 8365 belongs to? Off the top of my head, I, I would have to look to... All right. And let's just make sure it's whether or not it's on our list of interested parties. It is not. Okay. All right. And then so once Mr. Dinkins arrives at the Davenport Police Department, um, is that essentially the um, end of the analysis? Yes, it is. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to jump out of turn, you know, given what we've got by way of time that day, and I know she's got to fly back to um, Mexico City tomorrow morning. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel its remarks at State's Exhibit 116. States Exhibit 116. Do you recognize States Exhibit 116? Yes. How do you recognize States Exhibit 116? Uh, this is just another investigative draft that I created for this case for telephone number 563-468-0641. Did you become aware of an individual by the name of Jared Green? Yes. Reaching out to the Davenport, well, actually, re reaching out to Clinton authorities after Briasia Torrell's remains were discovered on March 22nd of 2021. Yes. Okay. Um, what was your understanding of Jared Brink and um, any import that he would have to this investigation? My understanding was that individual was the one that uh, pulled a vehicle out of the area where Briege's remains were found on the uh, night she went missing. All right. Um, I, I know that the gaps will be filled through later testimony, but um, at the time that Jared Brink was um, interviewed, did he have a specific date as to when he would have pulled a vehicle of interest out of the area where Briege's remains were recovered? I can't re recall if it was the specific date. It was around the general time frame of interest. Okay. Did you then do some type of analysis um, of cell phone records for Mr. Brink's phone? Yes. What was the purpose for that analysis? Again, when you get uh, um, information from someone, it's used to fact check to see if there's something that could show that that individual um, has the right date or it not. Okay. Um, would it also help to identify if his cell phone was located in a particular area on a particular date at a particular time? Yes. Okay. Um, did you receive um, data that would help you make a determination about where Mr. Brink's cell phone was located 
during the early morning hours of July 10th of 2020. Yes. And is that reflected in States Exhibit 116? Yes, it is. Do you honor the state when we move to introduce States Exhibit 116? No objection. Exhibit 116 will be admitted. Okay. All right. May I publish this, Your Honor? You may. Okay. Um, handing you or showing page one of States Exhibit 116, what does this document represent? This, again, is my cover sheet uh, regarding this case with Brasia Terrell. And that identifies the Verizon number of 563-468-0641. Investigative draft done on April 7th of 2021. Who does this telephone number belong to? It is uh, my understanding in the in individual that uh, pulled the car out. Okay. And is that Jared Brink? Yes. Thank okay. You. you know what I'd like to do? I want you to write Jared Brink on that first page so that um, it's just very easy just to see who that number is associated with. I'm sorry, the spelling of the... J-E-R-O-D and then Brink, B-R-I-N-K. Going to two, page two of that report that you prepared, can you explain what we are seeing on page two of this report? Yes, this is showing the activity on July 10th, 2020 for the telephone number ending in 0641. And it shows that there's only activity at two times during this time period. The first is 428 AM, which is gonna be depicted in the, uh, the top here, just above the red tag. The red tag on here, uh, it's not listed. It identifies the, uh, where Breja was, uh, remains were recovered. And then the next activity then is not until 6.59 uh, a.m., which is down here at the bottom of the screen um, in southeast uh, Davenport, essentially showing that sometime between 4.28 a.m. and the next 6.58 6, uh, a.m., the phone would have traveled from the first tower to the second. Give me a moment. All right. Um, I, I, I'm going to hand this to you, and I want you to look up close. For that bottom entry, um, relative to the direction of how that cell phone is hitting, um, what community would be right there in that area that that cell phone um, uh, ping would occur? The area I'm seeing is Buffalo, or um, I can't really, Andalusia? Andalusia? Andalusia, yes. So, Buffalo, Andalusia. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, as we go back then and we look at this particular document, um, I just want to make it clear. Um, are there a number of red dots spread throughout this document? Yes. What do those red, dot, red dots represent? Those, again, are Verizon cell towers. Okay. So at the time frame of 4.28 a.m., where is that device hitting off of? That's hitting off a, the, a cell tower in the vicinity of where Briage's remains were found. It's not the closest cell tower, but it is the next tower to the north. Okay. And so then relative to the um, direction of where that cell phone would be hitting on the tower, would that encompass a sector that would include, include um, the area west along Highway 61? Yes, it would. All right. And what time was that? That's 4.28 a.m. On what date? July 10th, 2020. And then the next time that that cell phone um, gives us location information would be where? Uh, 6.59 a.m. down in the Buffalo, uh, um, Buffalo area. Okay. Um, did you have information of where Mr. Brink was employed during that period of time? I don't recall. Okay. Was he employed in an area in Scott County? Yes. Okay. Then let's just run through some other things very quickly. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel at Vermont the state's exhibit number 111. Actually, let me do this in order. 110, 
May I approach your honor? You may. Okay. Um, I'm handing you state's exhibits 110 through 115. Okay. For our record, what is state's exhibit 110? 110 is my investigative draft for telephone number 563-459-7791, the phone of Helen Mosley. Okay. It's the defendant's mother? C correct. Okay. State's exhibit number 111. State's exhibit 111 is my investigative draft for telephone number 563-484-6834. Associate with Nita McQuay, the defendant's uh, sister. 112. 112 is my investigative draft for telephone number 563-200-3015. Associate with Fornell Lang. Why? Who is Fornell Lang? An associate of uh, Mr. Dinkins. Okay. Um, and why would he be somebody that would even be of interest? I believe that came up through uh, through interviews of some activity during during the time frame. Um, I can't recall specifically. Okay. Um, State's Exhibit 113. 113, again, is an investigative draft for telephone number 312-597-5484, a phone associated with Genesis Johnson. 114. Investigative draft 563-639. 8716, the phone of Andrea Culberson. 115. My investigative draft for telephone number 563-676-4247 for Aisha Langford. Okay. Let's just talk these very generally. Um, relative to Helen Mosley and Nita McQuay, um, when you went through and analyzed their phones, um, what did the data tell us about their activities um, during the early morning hours of July 10th and going into um, the morning of July 10th? My recollection was the ac activity was consistent with their statements of being near their residence and then eventually going to going uh, to the west uh, of the state to a casino. All right. Um, and did it show either of those phones, individuals' phones, ever being up anywhere near the apartment of 2744 East 53rd Street? No. Um, or even being anywhere um, near the area where Briasia Terrell's, or, yeah, Briasia Terrell's remains were recovered? No, for uh, where she was recovered. I will say there was some activity that could be up near the residence later after things were being reported on July 10th. Okay. Um, for Nail Lang. Again, there's, there was no activity on that phone uh, that raised suspicion or contradicted anything that was known. Okay. And was there anything about the location of his cell phone that would have tied him down um, uh, to the area of Schmidt Road near that RV? Um, one second. I believe on earlier on on the ninth that's possibly down down in that area and the tenth. Okay. If I'm correct. Okay. Um, and actually, let me ask you this: um, did, his, did his phone stay in a pretty static position during the time frames that were of concern? Yes. Um, did he actually have a residence in the area of Davenport? Um, that would be more um, toward the su southwestern portion? Is my understanding, yes. Okay, but was there any indication to show that that cell phone was moving around? Not during the relevant time periods, no. Okay, um, how does Genesis, Genesis Johnson even come up? Again, I, I can't recall the specifics. It's been, it's been a long time, but through interviews, I believe it was reported that she may have been with Mr. Dinkins on the 9th or the 10th. Okay, um, and, and uh, let me ask you this. Um, was there a review of individuals who may have called Mr. Dinkins dur during the relevant time um, frames where law enforcement was really focused on? Yes. Could she have possibly been an individual who called him? Yes. Okay, <laughs> and was there anything in her cellular data um, that would suggest that she um, uh, um, uh, would have been in areas of concern? 
No, there was all the activity was consistent to a, one specific area. And what would that area be associated with? I believe a, a residence that uh, came up during the investigation. Okay, um, Andrea Culberson. Yes, uh, her her records again were consistent with only towers usage that would be consistent with her residence. Okay, um, I actually want to go through that one. And let's look at Andrea Culberson. Okay. So page one of Andrea Culberson's report. What does page one show us? Again, just a cover sheet of my name, uh, where I belong to, the, and her telephone number. And then going to page two. Page two is now showing the cell tower and sector used by her phone from 12.40 a.m. on July 9th to 11.57 a.m. on July 10th. It's hard to see as this is a black and white version. But here is the cell tower located right next to the apartment complex, if, if not on it. And here is the tag of where that apartment is located, uh, clearly in that, that cell tower. And during that window of time, um, did her cell phone remain in that area? Yes. And then finally, States Exhibit 115. One fifteen is the um, investigative draft for five six three six seven six four two four seven. The phone of Aisha Langford. Okay, um, and in your review of the records for Aisha Langford, um, did you um, identify location information for her phone as well? Yes, there was. Okay, and then just overall, tell us what you noted just about her movement, if any. Her movements were consistent with what was being provided to us as where she was. Uh, her around her residence and her place of work. Okay. Um, do you recall where she was employed? I believe it uh, was a checkers, if I recall correctly. Okay. All right. And then um, was the cell phone hitting on towers um, around the checkers that she worked at? Yes. And then was her cell phone hitting on areas around her residence? Yes. Okay. And then... Um, uh, was there any information about her going over to the apartment complex at 2744 East 53rd during the evening of July 9th to drop off children's clothing? I believe in the earlier, yes. Okay. And then so was her cell phone movement consistent um, with um, that activity? Um, one second. Yes. All right, and then I'm going to address um, one other question. Did Aisha Langford's cell phone ever travel out of Davenport? Um, I can't, during this relevant time period, uh, no. I can't uh, recall for the overall records. I don't believe that it hasn't been a focus of uh, recently. Yeah, but it's of July 9th, well, July 10th. No. All right. Not. And so then um, during um, uh, the um, hours after midnight going into July 10th, um, you know, through her contact with law enforcement, was that cell phone ever up in the area of Clinton or where Briasia's remains were located? No. Okay. I have no further questions of this witness. Uh, Your Honor, did I introduce States Exhibits 110, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15? No. Um, Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to introduce those records. No objection. Those exhibits will be admitted. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, I'm showing you up there on the screen. Hopefully you can see it well enough. Um, I believe this is Exhibit 116. Is that correct? I, I can't see the, the number on it. Well, let's say it is. This is the, uh, the cell phone mapping data that you were asked to do, I believe, for Jared Brink's phone, right? Yes. And, again, on top there it says sectors used on July 10, 2020. Is that correct? Yes. Is that the only day you were asked to use or to provide that data? Yes. Why not July 9th? Um, I don't recall. Well, didn't you just testify earlier that you were asked to do July 10th because that was the date that Briasia's uh, 
Rajah was uh, disappeared? Uh, as related to Mr. Mr. Dinkins' phone when he came in contact with her, she was, as far as the witnesses that in the investigation, she was last seen at 3.30 a.m. on July 10th. And then Mr. Brink, I believe you testified that you were told, pulled Mr. Dinkins out of the ditch on July 10th, 2020. Correct. Who told you that? Uh, one of the detectives, I believe, uh, I can't recall, uh, might have been um, uh, the sergeant. You don't recall the sergeant's last name? Uh, Jeff Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer. Jeff Pfeiffer told you that? I believe so. Do you recall when he told you that? It would be very close to April 7th because he would have provided me the records and asked me to see if this phone was consistent with what he was being told. April 7th of what, what year? Um, should be of 2021. Okay. So April 7th, 2021, Jeff Pfeiffer tells you that Henry Dinkins had, pulled, had been pulled out of a ditch right there near Kunal Implement, near where Briasia Terrell's remains had been found by Jared Brink. Uh, what I was told is there was a witness that said they pulled somebody out. He had the records. He asked me to look at them and prepare an investigative draft of what that phone looked like on July 10th during that time frame. Okay. But what, what I'm trying to drive at here is he was certain on the date being July 10th. I think, well, I, I think that's the date of relevance. Okay. Date of relevance because that's the date she was last seen with, with last seen with mr dinkins at 3 35 a.m and it was believed it was early in the morning so july 10th obviously would be the focus of when he was there okay let's say that mr brink travels this exact route every day every day with the same cell phone his cell phone's on every day um, he's going to show this exact same tower every day isn't he uh, he, he could if he hits off a tower at that time frame, but if that's his route, that would be his route, yes. So you'd expect that every day, right? I would expect if his route that he would, if there's cell tower evidence, it would be consistent with that route. If Mr. Brink were to give us evidence or we hear evidence uh, regarding Mr. Brink's travel route to work every morning at 4 to 5 a.m., that he travels that road every day, then we can stand to expect that it's likely for him to have a cell phone data just like this we see in this exhibit, right? Uh, potentially, yes. Okay. And if that data is what we have, and he pulled Mr. Dinkins out, let's say, in April of uh, the year prior, there's no way of connecting those two, right? Uh, no. Uh, April of the year prior, there wouldn't be any data. Data for Verizon is only for okay. a year. So the, the leap in logic is that the officer tells you to get the cell phone data and put Jerry Brink at that location by cell phone data, first of all, correct? No, absolutely not. The question is, this individual says this happened at this specific time. As I said, we use the records to validate or exclude that. So I was given the records. I said, this phone is consistent with that statement. Okay. You, you say this witness says this. This witness being Jeff Pfeiffer. As far as I know. This is being provided to me secondhand. I did not talk to okay. the individual. But again, my question, very pointed, is this witness, Jeff Pfeiffer, said that Henry Dinkins was pulled out of the ditch by someone on July 10th. Okay. Is that right? I, it's, it's, I believe by Mr. Brink, if I'm correct. That's who pulled him out. And that's the assumption you were operating on, right? That, correct. I don't care who it is. I'm evaluating the records to see if, if where they are, and this is where they are. But again, the assumption you're working from is that July 10th was the day it would have happened, right? D the July 10th was the date I was told to analyze, and which, from the investigation, uh, would be what would be of interest. Okay. You have no <coughs> other cell phone data that puts Mr. Dinkins' cell phone anywhere in this area of Kunau Implement. Isn't that true? Uh, correct. And... You'd agree with me that a lot of reasons cell phones don't transmit, right? There's airplane mode, number one. Uh, someone could put it in airplane mode, yes. Someone could just turn it off, right? In my experience, people do not turn off their phones, but that is certainly something that could happen. If you have a 
eight or nine year old kid who's just a pain in the neck and wants to get on your phone all the time, uh, it wouldn't be unreasonable for a parent to turn that phone off, would it? I would give that child access to my phone. It's on my person. Okay. Um, phones go dead, don't they? They can. And when a phone goes dead, it doesn't transmit, does it? Phones that are on chargers don't go dead, but correct, in a, in a hypothetical world, that's correct. Okay. Now, the cell phone data analysis that you were doing, um, after about 5 a.m. that morning, Henry Dinkins never left uh, the town of Davenport until we see him with a cell phone pinging up in Clinton at 7 a.m., is that correct? Um, if I'm following correctly, so we had no activity between the 3 o'clock time frame where the phone is at the residence and he's at the gas station, correct? Correct. So he's separated from his phone during that time frame. His phone comes back on at, at 5.50-something time frame. So where he is clearly is separate from where his phone is. His phone's not transmitting, right? His, I'm sorry, I'm talking about what a witness said or as far as where the phone was located at that time. Yes, it's not translate, transmitting from that 3.37 a.m. to approximately 5.52, 5.54 a.m. Okay. Doesn't mean he's not with his phone, though, right? I believe we know at 3.30 he is not with his phone. Okay. Now, um, you also studied Aisha Langford's uh, cell phone coverage that day, July 10th, 2020, right? Correct. Do you also notice uh, phone calls that she was making that day? Was, was she making a high volume of calls? I, I don't recall. Okay. Did you notice any uh, numbers that she was calling repeatedly? Uh, from her records, I, I don't recall as all that was being done at the initial investigation and then as you eliminate people based on activity, you, you focus to where the evidence leads you. You eliminate people based upon activity because they're not moving around is what you're telling me. No, uh, the records are a part of it. So there's witness statements, there's surveillance video, all that is a part of the analysis. My part, obviously I focus on the phone records, but I also need to know other information to, to evaluate that. Like who she might be calling? Uh, I'm sure the detectives did track down who she was in contact with, yes. If she were calling people who have a, a long criminal record, would that be relevant? Your Honor, I, I'm going to, Your Honor, I'm going to object. There's no basis um, for this type of question, and just to throw that in is, is prejudicial. Sustained. Henry Dinkins, uh, once the phone came back online at 7 a.m. and came back to Davenport, uh, his phone remained on, correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. When did it go off? It, uh, if I can look up my notes again. Please do. The time I can confirm that it was off based on the, the 22 missed calls that went straight to voicemail was 10, between 10.08 and 11.11, 11, or 11.10 a.m. And based upon your investigation, apart from that time, uh, do we have any knowledge of Henry Dinkins having anyone else with him apart from his son, Dottorius, or D.L.? Not that I'm aware of. That's all I have. Ms. Cunningham? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Special Agent Fennerin, uh, let's assume that um, Mr. Brink's cell phone had not hit on that tower on July 10th in the area where Briasia um, Terrell's remains were found. Would then that be significant? I don't know if it would be significant. It would just mean we can't tell where his phone is during that time frame. So sure. we can't corroborate it or, or not. Okay. All right. But at any rate, are we going to look at the totality of all of the circumstances to understand the importance of that piece of evidence and where it fits into the equation? Of course. All right. And if someone doesn't have their cell phone with them, then is the cell phone going to hit on a tower? If, um, sorry, how that's phrased. Let, let, let me rephrase that. If someone doesn't have their cell phone with them, then um, that cell phone, is it going to hit only on towers where it's located? A cell phone is going to hit where the cell phone is located. All right. And if an individual doesn't have their cell phone with them, can we track their movements then? No, we cannot. All right. I have no further questions. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor.
Excuse me. Yes. Ms. Cunningham, are you calling your next witness? Uh, the state would call D.L. Will you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I swear. Please have a seat. Ms. O'Donnell, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you please say your first and last name and then spell it for us? Detorious Lankford, D-E-T-O-R-I-O-U-S-L-A-N-K-F-O-R-D. Okay, you said that awfully fast. Uh, Kim, were you able to get all that? Okay. Now, we've been referring to you by your initials. So, is it okay if I call you D? Yeah. D, how old are you? Eleven. When's your birthday? October 28th. Do you know what year you were born? 2011. Dee, what's the name of your mother? Aisha Langford. I want to talk to you about an individual named Briasia Terrell. Do you know who that is? Yes. Who is that? My sister. What would you call her? Brie. And was Brie older than you or younger than you? Older. Do you know how many years older? Three. Now, 
Now, I want to go back to the summer of 2020. Um, back then, did you live with your sister, Bree? Yes. How was your relationship with her? Great. Uh, were the two of you close? Yes. How close? Really close. It, fair to say she's kind of like a second mom? Yeah. Did she look out for you? Very much, yeah. Do you, do you know someone named Henry Dinkins? Yes. In the summer of 2020, uh, did you have some contact with Henry Dinkins? A little bit. Uh, at some point in that summer, did you go to a cookout and see Henry Dinkins there? At the river. At the river? Yes. Was your mother there at that cookout as well? Yeah. And what about Bree? I believe so. And did you see Henry then at the cookout as well? Yeah. Did you have some contact with him? Yeah. At that time, did you also meet um, a lady named Andrea? Yeah. Had you ever met her before? No. Were you able to determine if he, Andrea knew Henry? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, at some point, did you come to believe that Andrea was Henry's friend or girlfriend? I thought she was his friend at first. Just his friend at first? Yeah, I thought so. Now, I know you might not know the exact date, um, but was there a period in July of 2020 where you and Bree uh, were over at your grandmother or your Nana's house? Yes. And on that day, did Henry show up at your grandma's house? Yes. What's your grandma's name? Danita Gardner. Do you know where she lives, her address? 614 West 63rd Street, apartment number one. Can you slow down and say that one more time? 614 West 63rd Street, apartment number one. Now, on the day that Henry came over to your grandma's house, did you know he was going to come over that day? No. When he arrived at your grandmother's house, uh, what happened? He came and got us, and we went to his house, and we was playing games. Now, when you say he came and got us, who are you talking about? Me and my sister. Now, when Henry was at your grandmother's house, uh, at some point, did you learn you were going to be going with him that day? Yes. How did you feel about that? Good. Were you excited about that? Yeah. To your knowledge, did Bree want to go with you to Henry's house? No, I asked. You asked who? My grandma. You asked her grandma what? Can my sister come with me? Why did you want Bree to come with you? Because I feel comfortable around her. Okay. 
do you remember uh, if your grandma was going to allow Bree to go with you? She, I think she had called my mom, if I'm correct. Now, do you have an older brother as well? Yes. And are his initials CS? Yes. Was he over at your grandma's house that day? Yes. Did you want CS to come with you as well? I did. Did you also ask your grandma if CS could come? Yeah. Now, I believe you've stated that Bree did come with you that day, correct? Yes. Did CS come? No. Do you know why he didn't come? No, I don't know. When you and Bree left with Henry, did you guys have any clothing or bags or anything with you? Not at that moment. Did you get in the car that Henry was driving at that time? Yes. What kind of car was it? A black Camaro. Was anyone else in the car besides Henry, you, and Bree? No. After you left your grandma's house, where did the three of you go? To his house. When you say his house, who are you talking about? Henry and Andrea. Now I want to back up for a second. Do you recall going to someone else's house and playing video games? I don't recall. Have you heard the name Vincent Howard before? It sounds familiar. Little Vince? I don't think so. Okay. At some point though, you would have gone to Andrea and Henry's house. Yes. We're calling it a house. What type of building was it? It was an apartment. Had you ever been to that apartment before? No. Had Bree ever been to that apartment before? No. Once you got to the apartment, what did you do? I was playing GTA. And when you say GTA, what do you mean? Uh, I was playing video games. Does GTA mean Grand Theft Auto? Yep. Where in the apartment were you playing GTA? In the living room. While you were in the living room, where was Bree? In the back room. When you say a, the back room, what else was in that room? A bed, a TV, and a closet. In that apartment, was there only one separate room that had a bed in it? Yes. What was Bree doing in the back room? Playing some type of car game. Did you say car? Yeah. Well, was it a type of video game? Yes.
While Bree was in the back room, where was Andrea? In the back room as well. Do you know what she was doing? I believe on her phone. Where was Henry when Bree was in the back room? In the back room as well. Where was Bree in that room? On the bed. And where was Andrea in that room? On the bed. And where was Henry? On the bed. And where were you again? In the living room. What were Henry and Andrea doing on the bed? Watching her. Play Wa the watching Bree? Yeah. Did you find that weird? Yes. Why? Because I was in the living room alone and they were in the back room. You thought it was weird that they were leaving you alone? Yes. Now, at some point, as the, the evening went on, did you have dinner? Yeah. Do you remember what you ate? No. At some point, then, did you, uh, did your mom come over to the apartment? Yes. Now, did your mom actually come inside the apartment? No. Where did she stay? She was in the car. Where was the car? In the parking lot. Do you know why your mom came over to the parking lot? To drop clothes off. When your mom came over to drop clothes off, uh, did anybody go outside to pick up those clothes from her? Me and my sister. So what happened when you met with your mom? We grabbed the clothes and then we went back inside after we got done playing with the dog. That was my next question. Was your mom alone? Yes. Did she have a pet with her? Yes, she did. Was it your pet dog? Yep. Did Bree try to keep the dog? Yes, she did. She wanted to bring it inside? Yes. Did your mom allow that to happen? No. Where was Henry when your mom dropped off those bags of clothing? He was outside or he was inside. Can you say that again? He was outside or inside. When you say outside, what do you mean? Stand by the door. So he was either inside the apartment or outside of the apartment somewhere? Yes. Where was Andrea when your mom dropped off the clothes? Inside. After your mom dropped off those clothes, did both you and Bree go back inside that apartment? Yes. What did the two of you do after you both went back inside the apartment? We finished playing our games. 
And did you go back to the same spots you had been at earlier? Yes. And where were Henry and Andrea at those points? Still in the back room. Now, the clothing that your mom brought you, did that include pajamas or clothes to sleep in? Yes. At some night, or some, excuse me, some point that night, did you take a shower? Yes. Do you know how many bathrooms this apartment had? One. Did Bree also take a shower? Yes. Did the two of you shower separately? Yes. After the two of you took showers, were you given clothes to change into? Yes. Were they the clothes that your mom brought for you? No. What were you given to wear? A long white shirt. Do you know whose shirt that was? Henry's. Now, when you say a long white shirt, what do you mean by long? It's over our fitting. I think that's what it's called. Can you say that again? Fitting. How long on your body did the shirt go down? Kind of like our... Uh, knees. Did you think that was weird? Yes. Why? Because it wasn't our clothes that my mom brought us. After you and Bree changed into those white shirts, what did the two of you do? We ate, and then we lay down getting ready for bed. Where did the two of you lay down? In the back room, in the bed. Did you lay down at the same time? Yes. When the two of you laid down to get ready for bed, where was Henry? In the living room. Did you notice anything about Henry at that time? He was upstaring. He was what? Upstaring. He was staring? Yes. Staring at what? It looked like the back room that I was laying in. Where was Henry when you saw him staring? In the in the living room. Now when you were laying on the bed, where exactly were you on the bed? Kinda like in the middle. Where was Bree? Kinda on the edge of the bed. When you say the edge, was she closer to the window or the side of a bed? The side. Earlier you said there was only one bed, bedroom in this apartment. Is that fair? Yes. Do you know where... Henry and Andrea were sleeping that night? It looked like an air mattress. Where was the air mattress? In the living room. Did you ever see Henry or Andrea actually lay down on the air mattress? Andrea. And... When you saw Andrea lay on the air mattress, where were you? 
Still laying down. In the bedroom? Yep. And where was Henry at that time? Still sitting up. At some point, did you fall asleep that night? Yes. Do you know if Bree had fallen asleep before you? Yes, she fell asleep before me. Dee, are you a, a heavy sleeper? Not too much. What about Bree? Just a little bit. At some point, did you feel something during the night? A kick. Do you know where that kick came from? My sister. Where were you kicked? On my leg. How would you describe that kick? It was like a hard kick. Now, have you slept in the same bed as your sister before that night? Before we went to his house? Yes. Yes. Had she ever kicked you before while you were sleeping? No. Now, when you felt that kick, did you wake up? I woke up just a little bit. Uh, when you say you kind of you woke up just a little bit, was it kind of very brief when you fell back asleep? Yeah. At some point then, did you wake up again in the middle of the night? Yes. When you woke up the second time, what did you notice? That she was gone. When you say she, who are you talking about? My sister. What did you do at that time? I got up. Why'd you get up? Because she was gone out the bed. What did you start doing? I looked around the house. Was anybody else awake when you got up and started looking around the house? Andrea. What was Andrea doing? Looking out the back window where we was laying. Where was Henry? He wasn't there. What were you thinking when you woke up and you start, you notice Bree's gone, Henry's gone, and you're looking around the apartment? That he took her. Now, when you said Andrea was looking out the back window, what, what room was she in? The back room. Where the bed was? Yes. And that window in the bedroom, if you look out that window, what would you be looking at? The parking lot. So when you're looking around the apartment, you don't see Bree. What do you do? I asked Andrea where she was. Were you given an answer? She said she didn't know. Did you ask any other questions at that time? No.
What did you do at, at that point? Where did you go in the apartment? I looked around the house and then I sat down. Where did you sit down? In the living room on the couch. Do you have any idea what time of day it was at that point? I think it was morning. Why do you think it was morning? Because it, it was a little bit of daylight. So it was starting to get light out? Yes. D, did, did you have a cell phone? No. At some point, do you recall asking Andrea for her cell phone? Yes. Why did you do that? So I can call my mom or something. Why did you want to call your mom? Because it was just me there. Did Andrea allow you to use her phone? No. At some point, did Henry come back to that apartment? Yes. What did he look like when he came back to that apartment? He had a white shirt on and some shorts. How was he acting? A little weird. When you say a little weird, why, what do you mean? Like different than his normal self. How was he acting different? Was he, did he say anything when he came back to the apartment? No. What did he do when he came back the first time you saw him? He came back, he grabbed something, I don't know what he grabbed, and he left. So, where did he go in the apartment? To the back room. And again, is that the, the room with the bed? Yes. Did you see where he went in the back room? It looked like the closet. Do you remember which closet? The closet in the, the back room with the bed. Do you know how many closets are in that room? One or two. So it looked like he went to one of those, one of the closets? Yes. And he, he appeared to have grabbed something? Yes. Do you know what that was? No. Did you see any talking between Henry and Andrea at that time? No. When he came back to the apartment that first time you saw him, did you see Bree with him? No. After he grabbed something out of the closet, what did he do? He left. Right after he left, what did Andrea do? She was still looking out the back window. And again, that would be the window that looks in the parking lot? Yes. At some point, did, did you start to cry? Yes. Was it at that point that you started to cry? Yes. Why were you crying? Because she wasn't there. When you say she, who are you talking about? My sister. At some point, does Henry come back? A second time. Yes. 
What does he look like the second time he comes back? The same. He appears to be wearing the same clothes? Yes. Uh, does he, is he still acting a little weird? Not anymore. What does he do the second time he comes back? I don't remember. At some point, do you leave with him? Yes. Did that happen the second time he came back? The third time. The third time. So he comes back a second time, and then he leaves again? No. Which time? The the, second or third? The second time he came back, and then he left again? Yes. Did you ask him any questions or talk to him at all during that point? No. Did you observe any talking between him and Andrea? No. So then he comes back a third time to the apartment? Yes. What happens the third time he comes back? He comes to get me. Again, what is he wearing at that point? The same clothes. How is he acting? The same. So, normal at that point? Yes. When the two of you left, did he grab the bags of clothing that your mom had dropped off? Yes. Where did he put those? In the car. Which car? It was a purple Camaro. It was a purple purple car? Yeah. Do you know what kind of car it was? It was an Impala. Did you have any idea what time it was that you and Henry would have gotten into the Impala? Morning. I need to see counsel. We are going to adjourn for this evening. Uh, we will reconvene Monday morning at 9.30 in the morning. Thank you.